Well, good morning and welcome to City Hall. We'll get started with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Jason Murray is the pastor at Drakeford Park Christian Church. He'll lead us in the invocation. And afterwards, I'll ask uh, Councilwoman Meg Salyer. She'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everyone please stand? Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, I come before you at this time and this place that's been set apart for important work. And I thank you that I live in a city where we are allowed to pause and acknowledge you, Father, and your son, Jesus Christ, for providing the most important service to us, the salvation of the souls of any individual that will turn to him. In the meantime, Lord, while that work waits, there are problems to be solved in the city, resources to be managed, people to be served. And I thank you, Lord, for the city council and the mayor that are prepared and stand ready to continue to do that work. So I pray that your hand would be on them even this morning. I pray, Lord, that as they lead and serve us, that we'll be able to see our city blessed and grow. And uh, in all this, we know that you will be glorified. So bless these next few moments of work. And we pray and believe all this in Jesus' name. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll call the meeting to order and get started with a couple of appointments in item 3A and 3B. Cast you both. Those appointments passed unanimously. In item 3C, we'll take us a little bit longer. We have a wonderful new class of uh, youth counselors today. And um, why don't we start? Uh, Sam Bowman, a former Oklahoma City Councilman, has been very involved in this program recently. And Sam, would you mind uh, saying a few words to the to the audience here? And, allowing people to know more about the program, and uh, then we'll uh, introduce each of them. Thank you, Mayor. And Kim, if you'll stand up here alongside. Kim is uh, co-chairing uh, this year and brings uh, a great deal of uh, uh, new ideas and, and uh, excitement to the, to the program. Just delighted to have Kim. And I want to mention, too, that in uh, residence this year, uh, as part of the uh, planning team, is. Uh, uh, Amanda Harding, and, oh boy, back there. and our own A.J. Uh, Kirkpatrick will be with us uh, as part of the team and then leading it next year. Mayor, this is the, uh, will be the 14th year for the Youth Council of Oklahoma City. Uh, nearly 300 young students, high school students, junior and senior high school students, have participated in this program. That has meant representation from most of our public school districts throughout the metro area, many of our private schools. So we have near, we had nearly 300 uh, young leaders in this city who have become immersed in city government. And as student leaders, we, have, we, we count on them going back to their students in their respective high schools and bringing a sense of appreciation and a, a sense of uh, excitement and enthusiasm about this city, about what this city is about and where this city is going. And we are learning that be, because of this, this work and these young people, there are more younger people in this city thinking about staying here, raising a family, getting a job, and staying in Oklahoma City. And for that, uh, we are grateful. We're grateful to you, Mayor. We're grateful to the council for your support, uh, your continued uh, uh, encouragement, and, and more than anything, your, your personal relationships as you reach out to each of these young people and really make a meaningful connection. We have appreciated that and appreciated your support over the years, and we look for a very good year. Thank you, Mayor. 
Why don't we have the youth counselors come up now and stand behind their prospective counselor, and then we'll allow each uh, city council person to introduce uh, the two youth counselors and provide them with their, their pen. The uh, youth counselors will be undergoing a fairly uh, rigorous program throughout the next, I guess, nine months or so. They'll be exposed to all aspects of city government, each individual department, how we operate, how we work, um, and hopefully have a better understanding of city government when the program ends. Well, why don't we start over here. Uh, Pat, you want to get us started with the first one? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Oh. Um, I have a... Uh, Every year when I do this, I read the bi bios of the kids that they have selected to, to represent Ward 8. I think this is as good as we can get. And every year I'm surprised they get better and better and better. And this year I think we have two outstanding young men representing Ward 8. Uh, Sam Karshmer uh, is, goes to Heritage Hall School, and Derek Richards goes to the Crossings Christian School. So we've got some wide differences uh, uh, represented on, on, uh, from Ward 8. And it's typical of Ward 8. It is a very diverse ward. Uh, Sam Kirschmer, Kirschmer is a member of the Heritage Hill School Class of 2015. He's already made a significant difference in his community. In addition to writing the curriculum for the school prevention program of Heartline Suicide Prevention and Awareness, he has raised over $20,000 for the organization through his bar mitzvah. Annually, he leads a group from Heritage to participate in the NAMI Walk and has raised significant funds for them, too. Active in Heritage Hall Student Council, Sam has also been a class president for many years. He is currently a Spanish club officer, as well as a member of the Heritage Model United Nations team and the tennis team. Named 2013 Outstanding Young Youth, making a difference by the Oklahoma chapter of the National Philanthropy Day Awards. Sam also volunteers at the Regional Food Bank and teaches a bar bat mitzvah studies class at his temple. Sam concerned for OKC teens include the abuse, abuse of drugs and alcohol and bullying and teen suicide. He's got some real ambitious goals here. Sam, is there anybody you'd like to introduce here? My um, parents, my younger sister, and both sets of my grandparents are here in the front row. In the in, instance, uh, in the uh, need for full disclosure, I want to admit that I know these people, and they are outstanding people, and they produce <laughs> an outstanding young man as well. The second representative associated with Ward 8 is Derek Richards. Uh, Derek goes to Crossings Christian School. A leadership, worth ethics, honesty, dependability, moral character, all words used to describe Derek Richards, a member of Crossings Christian School, class of 2014. Active both at the Crossings and at the, <coughs> excuse me, at the Francis Tuttle Pre-Engineering Academy, Derek has participated in engineering competitions, a technical student leadership organization called Skills USA, and for the last five years, he's participated in the Crossings Academy, Academic Team. A regular on the Crossings Honor Roll, Derek is also a member of the National Honor Society, the National Technical Honor Society, Student Council, and Spanish Club. He's a member of YLX Leadership Skills Class of uh, 17, and then served on the YLX Board. Additionally, he participated in Leadership Oklahoma's 2013 Youth Leadership Class, 13, Derek is concerned about two issues challenging Oklahoma City's youth, youth who have everything and don't appreciate what they have versus those who have little and the weak family structures that have created too many youths in foster care. Yeah, Derek, do you have anybody here you'd like to introduce? Uh, my mom is in the um, back row in the front section. Ask her to stand up, please, so we can recognize her. Thank you very much for sharing your son. John? 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, before there was an Oklahoma City Youth Council, Councilwoman then uh, Willa Johnson used to grab two young students from different area schools. And so happens I was one of those many, many, many uh, years ago. So uh, truly um, that experience expired me uh, to one day run for uh, city council. So it's good to know that we now have a system that actually uh, trains young leaders uh, across the city on city government. Um, I shall never forget that opportunity uh, that Councilwoman Willa Johnson gave me uh, years ago before there was a Oklahoma City Youth uh, Council. Uh, Ward 7 is very privileged uh, to have two outstanding students uh, to be a part of this Youth Council. Uh, the first one is Sarah Leah. Uh, help me pronounce your last name, Laranaga. Uh, she is a member of the class of 2015 at Harding Charter Prep High School. She, she is described as a strong person academically and also socially. In the community, in the community, Sarah Lee, Sarah Leah serves on the Youth Council for Oklahoma. County Teen Service Board. In her spare time, Sarah Leah uh, enjoys doing the crafts at home, playing the cello, going out with friends and talking. Her concerns for teens of Oklahoma City include teen pregnancy. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome uh, Sarah Leah. <laughs> My mom and my two brothers are here. And then my avid teacher, who actually had me apply for this, is in the back over there if she wants to stand up. The next person I am grateful to have is Gonzalo, help me pronounce your last name, Marias. Um, he is, he attends, excuse me, Edmond Santa Fe High School class of 2014. He was described as a true leader who loves making a difference in his community. Uh, at Edmond Santa Fe, Gonzalo serves served as junior class president and president of the Spanish Club. He is a member of the National Honor Society junior representative and has recently completed a year as the vice president of Oklahoma DECA. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Gonzalo. <laughs> Anybody you want to recognize? I have both of my parents right there in the third row. Oh, would you stand up, please? Again, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Great, good morning. Um, I'm also delighted to welcome two uh, students to Ward 6 Youth Council uh, today. First, I'd like to introduce Mark McCaslin. Mark is a senior in the class of 2014 at Harding Charter High School. He has been a member of student council since he was a freshman. He helped found the tutoring club, where he serves as the president this year, and the health club, where he is past president. He's a member and current president of the History Club, and he's a two-year secretary and treasurer for the World Language Club. I wanna find out how many languages you speak. That's pretty awesome. Uh, in addition to being treasurer of the National Honor Society, Mark also participates in Harding's Rock Climbing Club. 
He's an aspiring artist and frequently is found either in rural Oklahoma or downtown Oklahoma City taking photographs. He feels that the youth of Oklahoma City lack a leader who can show them how to make the right decisions and they need more involvement. He thinks the youth need more involvement in wonderful organizations like Oklahoma City Beautiful. I agree with you. Do you have somebody that you'd like to introduce? Yes, my mother and brother are in the fifth row. If you guys would like to stand up. Mark, I'm going to go ahead and give you that. Councilman Ryan started a tradition of pinning them on. I think it would be better if you put that on yourself. So I'm going to, I'm going to let you do that. <laughs> My second student to introduce today is Zach Randall. Zach is a junior at Mount St. Mary's High School. He's been described as incredibly motivated with an unrelenting worth e ethic, a team builder, and a leader. He's a member of the Mount St. Mary's uh, class of 2015, as I said. He's a student council class officer a member of the varsity track team, and my favorite thing I've ever read, he's worked as the Chick-fil-A cow. I love that. <laughs> I think we're gonna put him to great use around here. That's just wonderful. Uh, he, Zach is very involved with his church. He's been a leader in vaca vacation Bible study and is an altar server. He's worked to clear land for a community building, and he's distributed hot dogs for the homeless in downtown Oklahoma City. In his spare time, which I don't know how he has much of, he likes to play sports with friends, and whether he's be studying for a test or just going out to walk around. He feels strongly about three issues uh, facing Metro teens and their bullying in schools, texting and driving, and the absence of father figures and families. Zach, I'd like to present you with your council pin, and I look forward to working with you. Is there somebody here you'd like to introduce? And please do ask him to stand. Um, my parents, my brother, my grandparents and my friend Stephen. Thank you and welcome both of you to Ward 6. It's going to be an exciting year. You've got lots to learn. David? Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, boy, I am delighted. We have uh, representatives from both the Moore Public Schools and the Oklahoma City Public Schools here this morning representing Ward 5. Those are the two school districts that serve Ward 5. The first is uh, Morgan DeLong from Westmore High School. She's a member of the class of 2014. She's a three-year member of the student council where she is president-elect, National Honor Society, um, and also serves on the uh, principal's advisory council. She's active at uh, Kingsview Free Will Baptist Church, and she also serves as a, also served as a page for the House of Representatives and was elected Speaker of the House by her peers. She's a four-time winner of the Masonic Student of Today Award, and she enjoys hanging out with her friends, visiting the Wichita Mountains with family, attending school and city functions, and watching the thunder with her grandparents. She's concerned with the influence of social media among teens, as well as a lack of motivation and self-esteem. So please uh, help me uh, congratulate Morgan. And Morgan, uh, is there anyone in the audience you'd like to introduce? And please have them stand. Okay, I have my parents and my grandparents here. Will you guys stand? Thank you. Our next student is Jason Sell. Uh, Jason is a class of 2000, a member of the class of 2014 of Southeast High School. Jason, I think if you'll do some research, you still may find a story or two circulating about Councilman White from uh, Southeast <laughs> High School. So uh, that'll be interesting. Give me all the uh, stories you can once you find them. Uh, he is active in a wide range of organizations, including student council, where he serves as vice president. The Key Club, which he was instrumental in founding, founding at Southeast High School and National Honor Society, the soccer team, and drumline captain. One of his main goals uh, is to improve South, the students' experience at Southeast High School. Uh, he's a regular name on the superintendent's honor roll and is a, uh, has a 4.0 grade, grade point average. In his spare time, Jason enjoys activities that include some form of physical activity. He feels the top three issues 
challenging Oklahoma City teens are poverty, substance abuse, and lack of proper education. And Jason, uh, I share those concerns with you, and I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Please uh, join me in uh, congratulating Jason. Do you have some opportunities? Would you please ask? If I could embarrass my uncle and wonderful grandma, if I can get them to stand up real quick. And we have two youth counselors that have been selected to serve at large. This is Kennedy LaHue. Kennedy is a member of the sophomore high school class of 2014. She is a four-year member of the Varsity Palm Squad. Uh, she's been active in a lot of associate activities, including reading with children three days a week at a local elementary school. Uh, she volunteers all over the city, and uh, buried here in her bio is the fact that she's the incoming president of the student council at Southmore, so congratulations on that. She is a three-year nominee and two-year winner of the Masonic Student of Today Award. She served as a Senate page at the state capitol. In her spare time, she loves to dance, watch her brothers and friends play sports, and in regarding the top issue challenging the youth of Oklahoma City, she cites addiction to social networking and the fact that it prevents teens from doing things for themselves. Uh, Kennedy, who do you have here representing you today? Um, my mom is, in, is sitting in the back with my two little brothers and my dad is standing in the corner. All right, why don't you all stand and let's show our appreciation. And we also have Dylan Cudd, who comes to us from Cassidy High School. He's a class of 2014. He's been described as a person who engages across differences, a good listener with a great mind for science. Dylan learned that Oklahoma is 42nd in the nation in science and engineering, and took it upon himself, along with some friends, to form an organization called FUSE, the Foundation for Science Enrichment, a science outreach for elementary schools. He also tutors fifth graders in Spanish. He is writing for the school newspaper, serving on the city council, or student council, city council will come someday in the future, I'm sure. Uh, plays baseball for Cassidy, monitors water quality for Project Blue Thumb. He's a Malone scholar since the seventh grade. He's been a summer intern on the Deep Fork Tree Farm. And in his spare time, he plays basketball, has Nerf gunfights, uh, swims and watches sports. He's concerned that today's youth does not know enough about history or current events and is afraid that could lead to a fragmented society in which one does not understand opposing viewpoints. Dylan, who do you have with you here today? I have my five grandparents in the second row and my mother, father, and two brothers in the back. All right, would you all please stand? Congratulations. Actually, it's my turn to uh, to introduce my uh, uh, folks this thing and to set Councilman Greenwell's mind at ease. I, I have a representative from Capitol Hill. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, the, um, the, the, the first one I want to introduce to you is uh, Denny Doe. Denny is, uh, is in the class of, uh, of 19, uh, 2014. This, he will graduate this next spring at Capitol Hill. He's been described as extremely personable, intense intelligence, motivated to excel in everything he does. Um, he's a co-captain of the school's football team, a three-year letterman basketball track, and, and is the incoming president of Capitol Hill's Business Professionals America chapter as a, uh, and a regular volunteer for FCCLA. He's twice been served the Class Citizenship Award and been named one of three model students of the year. In the community, Denny has volunteered for the Lee Elementary School Christmas Party and the Capitol Hill High School Annual Community Service Event, Read Across America. He also helps with his church youth group raise money to attend camp. In his spare time, he works out, plays football and basketball. And like many of his co-counselors, Denny is concerned about teen pregnancy, <coughs> drug abuse, and the lack of motivation in, in central Oklahoma teens. Welcome, uh, Denny Doe. How y'all doing today? Y'all look really beautiful. Um, I want to introduce my mom. You can't really miss her. She's wearing orange right there. Hey, yeah, she's a nail technician, so if y'all want to get y'all's nails done, go to her.
both my uh, uh, youth counselors this year are Oklahoma City I-89 public school students, something I'm very proud of. The, uh, uh, it's something I've worked for personally. I'm involved with the I-89 Oklahoma City Council Task Force to try to encourage members of the, of the Central Oklahoma City School District to participate more fully in everything that Oklahoma City offers, and it's really a pleasure to have both my uh, youth councils represented uh, by uh, I-89 schools. Uh, my second one, uh, uh, probably you can tell, if you look at her, you can probably tell that she uh, will be a senior at Southeast next year. She's, uh, Southeast people have kind of a way of, uh, what can I say? Um, she's been, uh, Wendy Ramirez, Wendy has been described as resourceful and independent, exhibits great people skills and tolerant of other people's points of view, which obviously <coughs> is necessary, she's going to work very well with me. Uh, the uh, words uh, from a letter of recommendation for Wendy, a member of Southeast class, th those were all came from the letter of recommendation that, that she received. At Southeast, she is a member of the National Honor Society, cross country, track and soccer teams, and a photographer for the yearbook. A regular visitor at a nearby nursing home, she is also an active member of Trinity Nazarene Youth Group where she tutors when needed. In her spare time, she enjoys playing sports and volunteering. About herself, she says, I'm very passionate about volunteering, outspoken, organized, and ready to learn. Regarding Central Oklahoma teens, Wendy is concerned that their selfishness prevents from seeing all those in need. Additionally, she feels that they are mistaken in believing that they can't make a difference at this age. So join me in welcoming her to the Oklahoma City Youth Council. Um, I'd like to introduce my mom in the back. Uh, it's my privilege to uh, introduce our two Ward 3 uh, youth counselors for this coming year. First is Saul Lugo. Uh, Saul is a, uh, goes by the name of Tony. Uh, he is a senior at uh, U.S. Grant, which is an I-89 school. Uh, his English teacher said about him, he's a leader among his peers, he's willing to help his fellow classmates, and he's very uh, committed to improving himself academically. Uh, besides his academic achievements of being on this, uh, the principal's honor roll, he's active in sports, he's active in cross country, he's active in soccer, and I think this is the first time that any of us have been able to say this. He's also involved in the rowing program down on the river. So that's an, a new sport venue coming uh, to Oklahoma City, and we're excited about that. Uh, in his spare time, uh, he likes to uh, travel and uh, be interested in other sports. He's also committed to his neighborhood. And uh, as a testimony to that, standing down here with a camera, I'm going to in a uh, embarrassed Tommy Hay, president of the River Park Neighborhood Association, who's here to uh, honor uh, Tony in, in his selection as a youth counselor. So I think that speaks well for him. Uh, Tony is concerned about the abuse of drugs and alcohol and uh, teen suicide and teen pregnancy in Oklahoma City. So we're real pleased to have uh, Tony Lugo as a Ward 3 council member. I'd like to introduce my good friend Frau Legesi, stand up, and my good friend Tommy Hangs. Then our other uh, youth counselor uh, is Faith Wolford, and Faith is a uh, junior at Christian Heritage Academy in Oklahoma City. The character quality that uh, she was awarded uh, and uh, recognized for last year at school was virtue. And virtue is doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And I think that probably sums up uh, faith in, in, in just a very short amount of words. Uh, she plays volleyball and cheers for CHA. Uh, she uh, serves on the Infant Crisis Center Teen Associates Board. She's a graduate of uh, leadership skills class and uh, she's concerned with the teenager's dependence on texting and media and their lack of motivation. And I'm going to let her introduce her parents because uh, uh, they're, they're a very interesting group also. So Faith, thank you for being Ward 3 City Council. I have with me today my parents and my youngest brother. They're on the front row of the second. Her, 
her, uh, her father is just one of the new football coaches and the new program starting down at OBU and was a coach on the staff at Southmore last year. So uh, very much involved in young people also. So it's a pleasure to have both of you as our youth counselors for Ward 3. But I'm excited to work with the whole class. What an outstanding class. And I appreciate the diversity of experience that the whole class brings. Um, we have two outstanding uh, participants this year in Ward 2. The first is Ian McCants, who comes from Heritage Hall High School. He, he really has an interest in international relations, and that's where he hopes to pursue a, a career. He's been a three-year participant in the Model United Nations. He was a founding member of the HERO Committee Against Bullying, with HERO standing for Helping Everyone Respect Others. He's a member of the French Club and a member of the Select Chorus that was named Allstate in 2013. He volunteers quite a bit at Integris Hospital in the Fountains at Canterbury. He's regularly on the honor roll, and he was a winner of the National French Exam Award, and he has a particular interest in, with, for our youth with suicide and gang activity. Ian McCants, and I'll let you introduce you. I'd like to introduce my wonderful grandmother, Patrina McCants. Please stand. Also in Ward 2, we have Min Tan, who comes to us from the Aztec Charter High School. She's also in the class of 2014. Member of the National Honor Society, the National Technological Society, the Health Occupation Student Association, of which she's the social chair, as well as the Student Council, which, of which she's the parliamentarian, the Art Club, of which she's the president, the AP Club, of which she's the vice president. Um, she attends Metro Tech for biomedical stu uh, studies and spends quite a bit of time tutoring students in biology. Uh, very, very hardworking. She paints and sings. She makes ornaments for soldiers and blankets for orphans. And her concern, primary concern for our youth, is education. Men, thank you. And um, I would like to introduce my lovely mom, Jane. representatives of Ward 1, they just uh, have a prior uh, engagement today, so I'll still introduce them. Um, first one is Shelby Branch. She is a, uh, she'll be a senior at Western Heights High School. Uh, she's an active member of their student council, and uh, she will be the president in the fall. Uh, uh, she is also active in Key Club Yearbook, where she's going to be the editor this year, uh, and she's also the manager of the tennis team. Uh, within the community, she has been involved with Council Road Baptist Church, OSU OKC, Upward Bound, the Oklahoma Heritage Association, the Metropolitan Library System, and Arts Festival Oklahoma. And uh, the second representative is uh, Erica Stevens. <clears throat> she will be a uh, senior also at Putnam City High School. Um, she has been active as a class officer and in student council, and uh, she has also helped raise money for OMRF. Uh, she's organized See You at the Pole and collected Christmas gifts for families for her school. Within the community, she is involved in a dance ministry called Young Women in Praise at her church. So, hi. <clears throat> I want to congratulate each of you and thank you for coming down today. And congratulations to the families as well. Um, I suspect many of you would like to leave now and, and not... Uh, need to uh, sit through much more of the council meeting. So uh, I'm going to pause about 30 seconds to a minute just to allow you all to get up without disrupting the meeting and allow the doors to open and close. Thank you all for coming down. And you're, you're welcome to stay, uh, but don't feel obligated. I'll look for a motion in item 3C and we'll officially uh, appoint the youth council. So moved. Second. Second. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. 
On to item four is the Journal of Council Proceedings. Item 4A is to receive the Journal of Council Proceedings for July 16th. And item 4B is to approve the Journal of Council Proceedings for July 2nd. Comments or questions on the journal? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item five is a request for uncontested continuances. Mayor, several this morning. Starting on the consent docket on page six, page six, item uh, 6A, there's been a, uh, an appeal filed by one of the unsuccessful vendors, and we need the time to do approve or to review that, uh, that appeal. So we'd ask that we strike item 6A. 6A, we, we will strike. And then moving on to items for individual consideration on the zoning cases on page 20, item 8A6. 8A6 is PC10346. Due to notice problems, staff is requesting that this item be deferred until August 27th to allow new notice to be uh, mailed. Again, that's item 8A6, deferred until August 27th. Item 8B, also on page 20, SPUD 706. The applicant has requested that this item be deferred until the August 13th meeting. That's 8B, deferred until August 13th. And then moving to uh, page 24, under item 8H1, item D, 4404 Northwest 11th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner's removed. Item G, 2521 Northwest 14th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has, been, has removed. Moving to item 8I1. Item E, 2520 Texoma. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item H, 1841 Northwest 8th. We ask that that be stricken. Owner has secured. Item I, 1954. Northwest 10th Street. We ask that that be stricken. Stricken owner has secured. Item J, 3345 Northeast 11th Street. We ask that that be stricken. Owner has secured. Item K, 1227 Northwest 21st Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Moving to page 25. Item Q, 400 Southwest 28th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item S, 1515 Northwest 30th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item U, 2130 Northwest 32nd Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item Y, 2324 Southwest 39th. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item CC, 2640 Northwest 50th. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item double E, 800 Southwest 65th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured item FF, 2732 Southwest 82nd Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. And finally, item GG, 401 Northwest 85th Street. We ask that that be stricken. And again, the owner has secured. Any other requests for uncontested continuances? Unless for recess the council meeting, convenes the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. How about a motion on the MFA? Move the items. Second. All right. Comments or questions? Your here? Honor, I have a, just a quick question uh -huh. on the uh, MFA B is in Baker. Uh, just when it's going to be done? And it doesn't have to be this, this morning sometime. It just, I, I will like get that time frame to you, sir. All right. Ready to vote the MFA? All right. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Adjourn the OCMFA. Convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. I have a motion on the PPA. A second. I believe we're going to have a presentation from Jane on item uh, C. Good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm Jane Abraham, Community and Government Affairs Manager for the City. And I will be brief. I just wanted to give you a um, brief update on the Centennial Land Run Monument and then present information about the contract amend amendment before you uh, for consideration today. Okay. So I have to go manual. <laughs> <clears throat> This slide just shows the east side of the canal where the largest grouping of sculptures um, has been completed. Um, 
let me just go through some background on the program very briefly. Um, overall, it was funded jointly with federal, state, and city funds, um, sculpted by uh, Paul Moore, who's a fellow of the National Sculpture Society and member of the Cowboy Artists of America. Uh, as of July 2013, 31 of the 38 funded sculptures have been installed, and we have one more sculpture that's awaiting installation right now. Uh, there are four sculptures that are in process in the studio, which leaves two of the um, first group of initial funded sculptures that are not yet started in this group. Um, <clears throat> Essentially, the project started in uh, October 1999 or, and first got started in terms of the sculpting in about 2001. Um, and in 2003, the casting cost increases forced the project to be altered so that 38 of the 45 sculptures were funded, leaving seven um, deferred until additional funding was identified. <coughs> and the next one. Um, this picture just shows where the next sculpture is going to be going in, coming out of the water on the uh, west side of the canal. And just sort of a little bit more on the current status um, of the project. If you want to go to the next slide. The latest um, uh, sculptures that were installed were a horse and a buggy. And I can show those later in this. Just I won't read through all these. These are the um, various sculptures that are in process right now. <clears throat> and this shows, um, again, kind of from the other angle where the next sculpture will be going in, coming out of the water, and then also uh, number 20, which is a, uh, another horse and rider, will be going into the water just, on the, just to the left of the, of the buckboard. So uh, in terms of the contract amendment, um, it would add back the seven sculptures that were deferred in 2003. But the schedule is structured uh, to both allow the city to set aside funds over time and also reflect the amount of time that it takes to produce the sculptures. Um, and then the agreement is conditioned upon the availability of funds and um, they would be set aside as, as available. Um, and this picture shows kind of a little bit further you know, toward the beginning of the line of sculptures, the horse and the buggy that were just installed uh, horse and rider number six will, six will be just behind this group, and then there's a horse and rider number 10 that would be just um, kind of behind the middle rider. And you can kind of see those on the, um, the map that I handed out. Also, this is back on the east side of the canal, <clears throat> shows horse and rider number 37, which is in the clay phase, will be right beside the two riders on horseback kind of at the back. And then this is uh, interacting with horse and rider number 36, which is falling down, which will be um, quite a memorable piece. Um, let's go to the next one. Um, this shows where the cannon is located, which is right at the beginning. And this is where, with the deferred sculptures, if we can fill in kind of that fairly large gap, there would be two horse and riders in there, and then also another um, that would, that would kind of connect the work a little bit better um, in terms of filling out the entire work as it was originally intended um, to be. And that's all I have. I'd feel free to answer any questions. John, so, I have a question. Jane, when do you think it's going to be finished? It's a really impressive group of statues. It is. Um, in terms of the, the initial group right now. The whole group, the, the, what we think is going to be the final effort out there. Um, is there anybody put an estimate of when that might be? Um, I want to say, you mean if we, with adding the all additional 45? 45. 45? The I'm whole sorry. thing. All 45. All 45, probably 2020 by the time they're all done. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, Any comments or questions for Jane on this side? Uh, I would like to make a comment. Yeah, Dave. Uh, you know, I think this is an extremely important monument and Unfortunately, it's not very well known. Uh, it's important to both the state and the city. Could we add some signage, whether it's along Reno or especially once the new Oklahoma City Boulevard's completed, and maybe even approach ODOT with some signage along I-40? 
Mayor Cornette, Cornette made that same request a couple oh, months ago, and I'm we are sorry. working. We are no, no, no. That's a, it's, it's a very, it's a very. Uh, you're, you're right on, and so we are pursuing uh, additional signage, both on our own and with ODOT. It's beautiful. I would even suggest, if possible, maybe we could have just a very brief video of, about it that would go up on the Oklahoma City government website, possibly. That's, that's a great idea. And um, we've been working in conjunction with Robbie Kinzel with the arts, the public yes. art project, um, to include information on this in a, um, a project that's called Museum Without Walls, which is an online public art um, website that will have information about the, the, you know, who inspired the different faces on the monuments, et cetera. So that's, that's great. Very well taken. Right. One more question, if you yeah, don't John. mind, Mr. Mayor. Um, will, we, will this particular project require more funds to be uh, added at a future date? Um, I, not likely. I think that this is this should be everything that we need in terms of um, to implement the final the final pieces. Okay. Thank you. That's what we anticipate. Yeah, it's an incredibly wonderful piece. That you know, it's it's I think the place I take people to first when they come from out of town just to get a piece of history and to be able to walk around and look back on the skyline and see you know, how Oklahoma City's evolved to this amazing place in which we live today. It's really exciting. It is. It is. Anybody else? Okay. All right, Jane, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, I'll also note that um, we need a motion to move item J into executive session. So can we have a motion? Yeah, to move the that? item. Second. All right. Uh, Cast your votes to move item J on the PPA into executive session. It passed unanimously. And then we already have a motion and a second on the rest of the PPA. But we have another report. Oh, we do? Yes. Okay. Uh, Wendell's here to introduce uh, Jim Brown. Talk a little bit about folks to talk about the Civic Center. Good morning, Mayor and Council. We're here today to speak with you through our consultant about the utilization and design study that is is uh, all but completed um, for the Civic Center Music Hall. As you all, of course, know, Civic Center Music Hall received a very significant renovation from the ma first MAPS project, and we are exceptionally proud to be operating that facility. Uh, we don't really consider the operation of that facility to be a task, but very much an honor. It's a beautiful facility. But as you also know, there were a number of uh, uh, portions of the building that didn't receive uh, renovations or full renovations uh, in that project, in that MAPS project. So this utilization study will help us determine uh, the uh, building's future, uh, and we do need to think several years in advance. Like all over other operations, um, performing arts facilities are uh, in a world of competition, and we need to continue to, to uh, increase the quality of that um, building. Uh, and with that, I would, I would ask Jim Brown to come forward and introduce our consultants who will make a presentation to you today from LMN Architects. Jim? And as Jim's coming up, I do want to remind the council that, that Councilman Salyer does sit on the foundation as this council's representative and has been on the steering committee for this uh, specific project. Good morning, Mayor and City Council. It's a great pleasure to come before you today. We're excited about the utilization design study for Civic Center Music Hall, and our team that basically put this whole project together was Julie Adams, L-E-E-D-A-P, Principal LMN Architects, Seattle, Washington. She has 16 years' experience in architecture project management. Two things she's currently working on is the Tobin Center for Performing Arts in San Antonio, which is a very big and comprehensive study, and also the Dena Ana Center in Anchorage, Alaska. Michelle Walters has 20 years experience in performing arts planning and development. She's managing director of AMS Planning and Research of Fairfield, Connecticut. She was COO of Virginia Performing Arts Foundation and executive director of the Richmond Symphony Orchestra. Omar Corley is our partner also for MOD, Moda Architects in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. We're proud of him because he was our project manager for Civic Center Music Hall and also for the OKC Museum of Art. And we also have Kelly Hedsel, who's our management specialist, who's gonna provide all the operations to make sure everything works fine. So I'd like to introduce Julie Adams. Thank you, Jim. And good morning, Mayor and Council. Good morning. Um, again, this is Michelle Walter with me with AMS. And uh, our two firms recently completed the design and utilization study for the Civic Center Music Hall. Um, I wanted to give some recognition to the folks who worked on this project. It was a comprehensive team of consultants 
uh, from both local and national firms, um, a group of folks who have a deep knowledge of performing arts centers, both the design and operation of them. Um, I'd also like to recognize the participation of uh, the Civic Center Music Hall staff, the foundation board, and city staff as well, um, and also including their resident companies and their arts organizations. Without their uh, participation in these sorts of studies, they would not be successful, and we are grateful for their knowledgeable contributions. Uh, as far as the study process itself, we started with a number of goals. First, of course, was to increase the utilization of those spaces. Uh, a critical component is to enhance the patron experience. Uh, also to support the mission of the resident companies. Uh, clearly, we want to help to develop future audiences for the facility and also engage the community. And then the study spaces list is what you see before you currently. Um, as we described earlier, uh, these are spaces that are ancillary and complementary to the Thelma Gaylord Performance Hall, um, but all very important to the functioning of the space and opportunities for potential utilization and therefore revenue in the facility. The scope of work for each of these spaces included the assessment of the existing uh, facility and equipment. It also uh, included a, an assessment of the range of performances and events that are currently held in those spaces and then those which could be held in the future. Uh, we also assessed the operating and financial impact of the proposed facility uh, renovations and upgrades, and then we work together as a team to put together a set of recommendations for each of those spaces with an associated probable cost estimate. Um, you will note as I move through each of the spaces that we have provided a recommended phasing of this work, um, and we also provided renderings as part of our scope of work to describe the ideas. So in terms of phasing, uh, you'll see that we uh, came to five phases. Um, Phase one being the main lobby, phase two, the Joe Levine Rehearsal Hall, phase three, 3D Little Theater, phase four, the City Space Theater, and phase five, uh, the Upper Balcony Space uh, Event Center. Each of these spaces was identified early as catalysts for change, and so each of them follows upon one another uh, in order to uh, facilitate the operations of the facility. Um, we also want to ensure that as these move forward, they enhance the missions of the resident companies as well. Uh, so two other things that we considered when we looked at phasing. One is to maintain the uh, performance and rehearsal schedules for the resident companies. So to that end, we established that two venues should be operating at any given time. Uh, and so we think we have achieved that. We also wanted to make sure that the uh, construction schedule uh, looked at those consolidated pieces of work to minimize the impact to the patron experience. Um, then this is a, just a list of, again, those five phases. Uh, you'll see that each has a, an associated bit of work with it, and I'll describe those as I move forward. So phase one, then, is the main lobby. This focuses on box office and ticketing relocation and concessions, both of which are um, uh, a primary uh, entry sequence uh, thing that uh, patrons see when they enter the space. Uh, for the box office relocation, we would um, relocate the existing box office, which was currently located in the circular shape in the middle of the lobby to the northeast corner of the lobby. This does several things. It consolidates the box office staff who are currently separated on a couple of different floors. It allows them better interaction. It also allows exterior access to ticketing. Uh, the ticket office is smaller in this case, and that's a response to a national trend for online ticketing sales. Um, this also then includes uh, the uh, inclusion of a bar, a fixed bar at this location in the lobby. Um, it will be complemented by custom mobile carts, an example of which you see here in the lower right-hand corner of the slide. Those would be located strategically throughout the space and would serve uh, food and beverage for the patrons, and those are supported by concessions carts as well. Uh, another reason we put this as phase one is that it's a very visible, obvious uh, renovation that can help create excitement for future renovations. Phase two, then, is the Joel Levine Rehearsal Hall. This is a rehearsal space um, that is currently located uh, in the southwest corner of the building. 
Uh, it includes a uh, renovation of the hall to a multi-purpose room that would serve for performances and rehearsals and also for banquets and dinners, so other private events. Uh, it also includes uh, renovation of existing shelled spaces at mezzanine and balcony levels uh, for food and beverage use, and also a small bit of catering uh, upgrades to the prep kitchen for the Hall of Mirrors to help um, improve the service to that space. Um, this is the lowest uh, currently utilized space in the theater, uh, so it's a great opportunity to provide a usable space. It also gives the resident companies a home uh, during future renovations. So what would this look like? Uh, one example is uh, this. This is a dramatic for performance mode. Uh, theatrical equipment and acoustical um, provisions have been given to make this a excellent theatrical space. It also can be easily transformed into an elegant space that could be used for meetings and banquets. Um, we are maintaining the existing windows. We'd love to use the daylighting and views provided by those elements. We've also added a glassy element to the end of the, um, the room, which allows for uh, connection to the circulation of the Thelma Gaylord, it gives this space its own identity. And then finally, uh, an exterior shot, um, another transparent element that could be added to the south facade of the building, again, giving this hall um, its own identity uh, and allowing activity to come out from the building onto the street. So then phase three is the Freedy Little Theater. Uh, this is a space that is very near and dear to many people's hearts. It's a space that has not been touched in some time. This would include a fully uh, renovated theater and associated renovations to the north lobby and public restrooms for that space. Um, important uh, changes to make in this space include the expanded utilization of the space, updated theatrical and lighting equipment, not just in terms of modernization, but also in terms of safety for the users. Uh, of course, the enhanced patron experience, um, bringing into compliance some exiting and egress and accessibility issues. Um, and as I mentioned, also a first priority for renovation among the stakeholders, the arts organizations that we talked to. And this also, uh, according to AMS's research, offers the largest amount, uh, opportunity for new rental activity. And this space would uh, support musical theater, dance, drama, and lecture. So in this section, uh, moving left to right, uh, there are, would be minor, uh, minor modifications to the back of house spaces. Uh, we would renovate the stage house, all new rigging, et cetera, all new theater and acoustical and aesthetic uh, material upgrades within the audience chamber itself, and then new connections to the north lobby. In the next section, then, you can see that uh, we started in our concept design phase to play with the forms in the theater space that are developed uh, by the requirements for the acoustical and uh, theatrical equipment. Um, and our approach is, again, to try to draw the Freedy lobby out into the north lobby, so there's a, a, a sequence there for the patrons. So then the space, uh, again, this is a multifunctional space. What we try to do is bring together uh, an interesting palette of materials along with all of the technical requirements and create a room that can really recede, as in this picture here, um, to focus attention on the stage, or conversely, be very present and become part of the audience experience in um, performances like music or in lectures. And then finally, uh, like the Joel Levine Rehearsal Hall, we've added an exterior element which helps give this space uh, its own identity and connects to the community uh, with activity and light. Uh, phase four, then, is the City Space Theater. This is a small black box space in the basement of the building. Uh, the important renovation aspect of this is that it would provide rehearsal space for the dramatic companies in the facility. Um, what that does is lets the stages open up in the Freedy and the Joel Levine for private rental events, which equals greater revenue. Uh, renovations here are limited to the removal of a couple of columns to create a greater open footprint for rehearsals and some uh, uh, minor theatrical upgrades. And then finally, phase five is an upper balcony event space. Uh, this is an area that is unknown to many people. It's uh, currently unused. Uh, it's a large space located directly above the Hall of Mirrors. 
Uh, what we conceived of here is a multi-purpose event space that could be used for pre and post function uh, dinners, uh, could be used for lectures, other events. Uh, we've provided an, an idea for public restrooms and a complement of a catering kitchen that could service that space. Uh, in the plan, you can see that there, uh, it is quite a large space. It takes over the entire uh, east portion of the, uh, the top floor of the auditorium. It would have connections to the Thelma Gaylord circulation. Uh, it could be subdivisible with uh, two rooms and with their own lobby spaces. And then you can see the new restrooms and catering kitchen uh, to either side. Uh, in order to support the functions of meetings and events that have been discussed for this space, it's necessary to lift up the ceiling to provide greater ceiling height. Uh, that does a couple of things for us. It gives us some natural daylighting and views, and it also provides uh, access to the rooftop for potential pre-function um, activities or um, small events. And then this is a rendering of the space. Uh, we're standing here at the top floor of the Thelma Gaylord lobby, looking toward the event space. And you can see that there's this very open, transparent connection uh, to the room and then to, to the sky beyond. And of course, there would be accommodation for closing off that space to the Thelma Gaylord circulation. And then finally, an exterior rendering of that same uh, space. Uh, because of the added height to the building, uh, we believe um, that it needs to be stepped back from the parapet and done in a respectful way to the existing facade. So uh, costs for this uh, are summarized here, and I think you all have a more detailed version that you're looking at. Uh, total project cost for all phases, one through five, would be 38.4 million. Um, to be clear, this reflects total project cost our team developed construction cost, and we were advised by the city on soft costs to come to these final dollars, and this does exclude escalation. And then finally, I would just like to recap. Um, this is a, really a utilization study, but what we tried to do is give a lot of thought to um, the transformation of the spaces and the venues and how we provide the greatest flexibility, functionality, uh, how we foster the resident company work, um, how we approach new and existing audiences and uh, better connect to the community. Thank you, any questions? <coughs> any questions on the report? Your Honor, I have a Yeah, question. Pat? I think it's an excellent job, I'm really excited about it. Thank but you. as a uh, frequent patron of the facility, I get asked a lot of questions about the guest experience you mentioned earlier, and they, I don't know how to say this delicately, but they revolve around the, the restrooms. Have yes. you looked at the restrooms at all in this particular study? I know it's a terrible subject, but it's, it's yes. important to the guest experience. Absolutely. The uh, restrooms and the length of lines and the line weight are all critical to uh, quick turnover during uh, intermissions. So yes, uh, we did look at some of the restrooms, uh, particularly in regards to the event space. That would be another large assembly space. Those restrooms could be dedicated to that space or become uh, an overflow space for the Thelma Gaylord. Uh, and I believe that in some of the 2001 renovation that restrooms uh, were looked at. But yes, we are very aware of that They concern. were looked at, but I don't think they did a very good job. It's personal opinion. Okay. Based on what I hear from some of the patrons. Uh, the, um, one, the other issue that I think I've been tapped on the shoulder about several times is signage. There's mm -hmm. a lot of facilities there that people don't know about. They can't get there from, and they walk into the main hall and right. they, they look lost. Is yes. there going to be an effort to put some better signage? Absolutely. Uh, when we were doing the interviews with some of the arts organizations, we received feedback that uh, they had had calls from patrons who would, they'd say, you're going to this facility, and they'd say, where's that? And they'd say, it's in the Civic Center Music Hall, and they didn't even know. So uh, a lot of the imagery that you see here is, uh, our thought process getting to that uh, issue because yes, there is no real way to identify what those spaces are or what happens in them. And we think that's an important thing to do. Mm -hmm. All right, other comments and questions on this report? No, no, yeah, Pete? Um, you know, I've, uh, the, the, the Civic Center uh, renovation under MAPS 1, in my opinion, was probably, uh, except for the river, probably the most important thing we did in MAPS 1 in terms of what, what it, what it did for that building. Just, mm -hmm. To me, it was amazing. 
you know, as, some, as a lifelong resident of Oklahoma City, I mean, I saw my first ballet there, but I also saw my first college basketball game. Mm -hmm. um, I saw uh, uh, my first Broadway musical there, but I also saw Chuck Berry there. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned that in moving forward, uh, we're, we're, we're forgetting everything that happened there before. When I was a young person, it was, that was the municipal auditorium, and it was, and it, it, it meant the municipal auditorium. Everything from the first New Year's Eve party I ever went to as an adult mm -hmm. to uh, seeing the Will Rogers Follies there has occurred in that building. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that for very little extra, we could, we could some way recognize what that building has been to Oklahoma City, how much it's meant. The idea that, that it is now a music hall, it's wonderful. I think I'm, I'm all in on that. What I would like to do is make sure we don't do what we did with the park, and that is for, just wipe it like a clean slate and act like nothing ever happened there before the park got, this current park got there. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see some recognition on the inside of the building about all the great things that occurred there when we only had one building to do all those things in. Mm -hmm. And I. Don't take that as a criticism what you're doing because it's not. It's just kind of an addendum to it. I'm just, I'm, as, uh, as I get older, I'm probably much more conscious about what went on before us than I, than I was at one time in my life. But there are so many wonderful things that happened inside that building mm -hmm. uh, when we didn't have any other place for them to happen but there. Uh, I don't know how many years the all-college basketball tournament was paid, played on the stage mm -hmm. there. I mean, it's all, when I go there now, it's almost impossible to imagine that being a basketball floor, but, right. but it was. Yeah. And I, I would like to see some kind of memorialization of all that someplace in the building so we don't lose that connection of how important that building was to us for, what, 50 years probably, or, or more probably. Mm -hmm. Just something. I mean, some bronze tablet that... Mm -hmm. That's a good set. Good. You know, good Something. suggestion. Mayor, can I just make a very quick uh -huh. comment? I know we're pressed for time a little bit, but I just want to recognize once again the team. I, you know, I think the, the um, definition of this as a utilization and design study was incredibly important because I think, as was mentioned, lots of this space that's available in the Civic Center people don't know about. It, you know, from the Joel Levine Rehearsal Hall, which is a fabulous space that has so much capability. And I, I think what I liked particularly um, as this process evolved was watching how this magnificent building could be brought a little bit more outdoors and reach the public by creating some of these outdoor signage and the glass venues and potentially even the rooftop um, space. I, I think we really bring the building, Pete, alive um, and have so many um, opportunities to prevent, present more things in that space. So. It's a big number, and uh, I took a gulp when I saw that, but um, under Jim's great leadership, I know we're going to take a hard look at, at how we do that with private um, support as much as we possibly can. So thank you all for the great work you did. It was a huge team, very comprehensive, and I think you brought us something in those phases that we can really work through. So Terrific. appreciate it very much. Thank you. Right. Appreciate your work. All right. Thank you. We have a motion. We'll be voting on the PPA except for J, which we've already moved into executive session. So cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll recess the OC PPA and convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. There are two items. Second. All right, comments or questions on item A in the EAT? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OC EAT, reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. Move the item subject to individual consideration. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second on the consent docket. Jim, do we have presentations on the consent docket? I don't believe, don't okay. believe so. All right, comments or questions there on the consent docket? Your Honor, I have a, a couple minor questions. All right. Item V is in Victor, uh, item Alpha Alpha, uh, and item Alpha X ray, or Alpha, pardon me, Alpha AE. And then uh, uh, item B is in Boy E. Mayor, right. I have just six T as in Thomas. Okay. Pat, you want to get started with item V? V is, Victor, is a, a project that was a, a good project, but we waived the bidding 
competitive bidding requirements. And I wonder if there was an, a, uh, an explanation that we should attach to this as to why we waived it. What we waived was the, uh, it, it came in over the engineer's estimate, we waived that portion of it, and we believed uh, uh, that it was the best bid that we were going to receive on, uh, on the project. But it was over, all the three bids, as I recall, were over the estimate. Uh, Eric, is that correct? Yes, I do believe that's correct. And, and again, it's a, it's a requirement of the council. The engineer's estimate is not a state competitive bidding act requirement. It's an item of the council, something we put in our documents that's waivable by you. I understand that. I, I, I'm not complaining about it being waived, but I think we ought to document of the rationale somewhere in here so we can defend it to the public if it becomes an issue. If I might add just a couple of comments, you know, one of the things we've been challenged with on the Kitchen Lake Pro Park project is that the, the budget has been reviewed over and over and there's some minimum improvements that we'd like to provide as a part of the work. Um, with this, we've value engineered absolutely everything that could be taken out of the project to still actually make it a project and one that would meet the bond issue requirements. And so. I think part of the justification from us today to you would be that uh, unless we take something out of the scope of work, if it's not going to include the parking lot or not the fishing pier or something just in the very basic elements of the project, it's the only other way that we're going to be able to reduce the cost. So we do feel it's the best cost that we're going to get for this project. Like I say, I just would like to have that documented someplace. No, that's a good point, Mr. Ryan. We'd be, ha we'd be happy to. I think we felt on this one that there were a limited number of bidders that were very tight, and we thought that it was, it was, it was they were good bid prices. I'm not, not so you, but you're right. We should be able, we should document that better. Um, and Alpha Alpha is to, has to do with the, the uh, uh, landscaping of the city Civic Center Park, and this deals specifically with the fountain. Do we have any idea when the fountain is going to be in operation? I know the kids come to the museum and they're looking for it. They're the uh, the Civic Center fountain is actually in operation. The fountain repairs that you have as a part of this change order are actually the City Hall fountain. Um, okay. okay, and uh, and following the approval of this change order, the work will be be completed, and we'll try to get it working as quickly as we can. Thank you. And then on Alpha E, um, this has to do with uh, some environmental issues affecting our trail. And uh, did we ever determine what the source of this oil flowing on the trail was? was? And what efforts were made, if any, to mitigate the, the flow of oil? We, uh, we were able to determine the source of the oil. If, uh, if you're familiar with the area, this would be in the area of 23rd Street. This is where Oklahoma City Public Schools maintenance facility is located. Um, there were some underground storage tanks that over a number of years um, obviously leaked and contaminated some of that soil that affected that trail. So it wasn't until construction that we identified that. But with the engaging of environmental engineers, we were able to reconcile that. We were able to close it as a site that was opened as a contaminated area. It took a number of years. It didn't take a number of months. It took some time for us to do that. But it's complete now. Um, it's safe um, and it's open. So we're ready to accept that. So the flow of oil has been mitigated? It has been mitigated to the standards that are required, yes. It sort of makes me nervous when you say standards are required. But well, anyway. and, and let, me, let me clarify. I mean, so there's, there's different things that you can do to mitigate hazards. In this case, it's an outdoor area. Um, it's, uh, it's not a permanent structure that's being built on top of that. So in a lot of cases, when we do parking and trail type facilities, um, they're considered less risk than, say, perhaps if you're going to build a house on top of a contaminated area. Um, but again, we went through a very lengthy process with the environmental engineers um, and with the Oklahoma Corporation Commission to make sure that it was closed safely. Thank you. And item um, BE is uh, just a question. Uh, we're doing some work on General Pershing Boulevard. Has anybody contacted the railroad about the crossing? Yes, we have. Very good. Thank you. I just want to make sure that progress doesn't die because that is a, one of the roughest crossings other than 10th Street that we have to get to. 10th Street? Not, not bad now. Well, it's getting better, but it's not good yet. Okay. Uh, Meg? Mayor, thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, mention uh, item 6T is four new uh, Project 180. Uh, streetscape packages that we're going out for final plans and specifications. We're looking at uh, Dean A. McGee from Robinson to Broadway, Northwest 4th Street and Robinson, Robinson Avenue from Park Avenue to Dean A. McGee, and Robert S. Kerr from Harvey to Broadway. So for those watching and for those that will watch, we're going to be tearing up some streets again, but um, you know, another very exciting opportunity to, expend, to extend um, the great work that's already been done with Project 180 for this part of downtown. And I think it's important to point out that we're in, in the past we had 
up to th uh, three different streetscape projects going at the same time. We're, we're not going to do that this time. It's, it's, it's one project. Now we'll have another one coming out, but, but the fact of the matter is we're only going to release a smaller section to be completed uh, at one time. So it'll just be a few blocks at a time instead of the, uh, the larger uh, scale projects we had last a couple of years ago when we were trying to, to meet some specific uh, construction dates. Great. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions on the consent docket? All right, let's vote it. Pass unanimously. Move on to the concurrence docket. Move the item subject to individual consideration. All right, and no presentations here. So we have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions from council or anyone else about the concurrence docket? All right, let's vote. Pass unanimously. We're on to item eight. These are items that require a separate vote. We start with a series of zoning cases. The first is in Ward 2. It's an ABC issue at 2418 North Guernsey Avenue. It's in Ward 2, Ed. Unanimous planning commission uh, vote. No protests. I move for approval. All right. Anybody here wishing to speak on item 8A1 today? All right. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8A2 is an ABC issue in Ward 7 at 1020 East Britain Road. John? Anyone signed up to speak, Francis? No one has signed up to speak. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on item 8A2? I move for approval. Second. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8A3 is also an ABC issue in Ward 7. The address is 9300 North Kelly. John? Do we have any protesters? No one signed up to speak. I move for approval. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And item four is a zoning case in Ward 1. It's at 10546 Northwest 10th Street. It's currently AA Agricultural, and it would become an I-2 Moderate Industrial District. James? Uh, uh, has the easement been accepted yet? Has the easement been does, accepted? Does that, it has. It has. Okay. Well, uh, nobody signed up to speak, I assume. No. Nope. Okay. I, uh, I move for approval. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. On to item 8A5 is a zoning case in Ward 6 at 2546 Northwest 1st Street. It's currently R1 single family residential and it would become an I1 light industrial district. Meg? Yes, I think we've got a similar situation here. Um, there were no protests at the Planning Commission meeting. Um, Bob, we had an easement that has been. No protests. This is an area that's transitioning to industrial and it's consistent with the zoning pattern. And has the easement been yes. received already? So I would move approval. Second. All right, we're voting on item 8A5. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8A6 has been deferred until August 27th. Item 8A7 is a zoning case in Ward 8 at 770 West Memorial Road. It's currently 01 Limited Office District and it would become an R1 Single Family Residential District. Pat? Uh, your Honor, is, uh, did anybody sign up to speak on this one? It was unanimously approved by the, the uh, Planning Commission, and it essentially allows an individual who owns the property to construct a house on that property. And uh, I would move approval. Second. All right. Cast your votes on item 8A7. It passes unanimously. Item 8A8, we're back in Ward 2 at 9017 North University Avenue. It's currently R1 single family residential, and it would become a new plan unit development. And this is the John Marshall. Uh, this is John Marshall High School. This is the, the uh, um, this is to create a multifamily residential development in the area of the John Marshall High School, which unfortunately at this point has become dilapidated and a, a target for crime and vandalism. Uh, this is a, a project that we've had multiple town hall meetings. There certainly were protests. Um, there are uh, many who. Uh, have an uh, affinity for the John Marshall High School. There were questions about uh, uh, keeping some park area for the neighborhood. I think uh, we've gone through uh, some, some changes. I would ask, is, is anybody signed up to speak or no? Dennis, can I just add, the staff had 12 recommendations, technical evaluations. Are we, have we accepted all? Good morning, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive. Not to step on my father's toes, but I can, I can address those. Okay. <clears throat> uh, throughout the TEs, we had to amend and modify. Uh, number one, we had to add the language uh, allowing telecommunication towers. There's a current telecommunication tower on the site. Right now, it's attached to the old uh, chimney on the school. So there's a long-term lease. 
So what we did was we added that to TE number one, and then we deleted TE number 10, and then all the other TEs were, were agreed to. So this, this passed the Planning Commission unanimously. I mean, certainly there's diversity of thought, but I'd say anecdotally, the, the large majority of, of neighbors have, have wished that this go forward and I'd move approval. All right, comments or questions then on item 8A8. All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Thank you. Item 8A9 is a zoning case in Ward 8 at 15701 North Rockwell Avenue. It's currently AA Agricultural and it would become a new plan unit development. Pat? Yes, sir, thank you. Is the applicant here or his representative? If we can have your name good, for the records, please. Good morning. Kendall Dillon with Craft and Toll, 214 East Main, representing the applicant, and uh, be happy to answer any questions you have. But first of all, the, the easement was requested. Has it been submitted? We submitted it on July the 24th to okay. staff, yes. And second, the Planning Commission approved that the uh, subject to some technical evaluations be included. Has the PUD been amended? Yes, we've corrected those. There was one TE um, that we did modify at Planning Commission, which they approved, but all of those, as per that staff report, have been revised and resubmitted. Your Honor, this is a continuation of the transition of that area out there from uh, just uh, AA to commercial and residential activities. I would move approval. Second. All right, we're voting on item 8A9. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. Thank you. Item 8A10 is also in Ward 8 at 12301 Northwestern Avenue. It's currently a C3 community commercial district, and it would become a new PUD. Pat? Uh, I see the representative of the, the, Brian, would you like to? Are there any questions of Brian, who is representing this? This is a uh, um, consistent with the zoning that's been going on on 122nd in that area. It's uh, rapidly becoming a commercial area. Uh, are there any questions of Brian? There were some, uh, when the Planning Commission approved it, there were some uh, technical evaluations. Are those all acceptable? And they're all, the POs has been revised to reflect those. I move approval. All right. We're voting on item 8A10. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8A11 is a zoning case in Ward 7 at 641 Northwest 164th Street. It's a PUD and it would become a new PUD. And John, we have one person that has signed up to speak. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, can we hear from the applicant and then from the pro protest? You those? bet. Uh, right. Mark Estes. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want the applicant first? A applicant I, first. I missed it. If you'll just hold your. Hold your spot, Mark. I'm sorry. Member, I didn't, members didn't hear it of the council, Brian Coon with Hewitt Zollers represent the application. Um, this is going to be a senior living center, 100 units, uh, three stories. It's all pretty much congregated down around where the word vacant is on your map there. A lot of flood zone on this property. Um, we are amending the legal description. There was a couple homes on the north end by where it says R1 that some gardens had encroached into the property many, many, many years ago. <coughs> And with the previous owner, they ended up deeding that property to those homeowners, and there was a retaining wall, so we deeded that. So we've amended the application, making, making the uh, legal description a little bit smaller, so I do want to do that. Um, one of the TEs, or one of the comments at Planning Commission was the sidewalk, and we will extend the sidewalk across the frontage of our property. Be glad to answer any other questions you may have. Any questions for Brian right now? Sure. Yeah, I, I have a question. On the um, background, uh, item number three, the the, uh, or two, I guess it is, the PUD is going to require a uh, age restriction of 55 years or older? Yes. Can they do that? Can it PUD be, reflect something that's not in the federal regulation? I didn't know you could do that. That came from staff, so. We've been advised by legal that it is a uh, enforceable okay. uh, provision. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. When, when we get to that age, we'll appreciate that. Now, one quick question. Now, would this particular uh, project be a tax credit uh, senior living center? I don't believe so, no. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Mark Estes. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. We will need your name and address for the record, please. I'm Mark Estes. Uh, I live at 16504 Sunny Hollow Road. Um, that's basically when you're looking at your map, 
The entrance on the east side is Lexington Housing Edition. I'm a long-term resident there, and I'm basically the second house going into that neighborhood. Um, I wanted to spend just a brief second because this vote will be very important to this area. And, I, and the reason that we want to continue our concerns and protests lodging against this development is similar to what it was four years ago, and you may remember this same property came up with a very, very similar idea and design. And the reason it's become more important now is because not only is this property coming up, but you have two more across the street coming at you in the very near future that are really gonna change the entire concept of what this area is. So I just really had two just brief things. I know you have a lot of agenda, it's been a long day. But let me just show you two brief things that really kind of stress our point about our concerns. I don't have a fancy easel, so I'm just gonna talk from this. But basically what you're seeing here is the aerial of that area, and it's pretty obvious where 164th Street is. And this property, well, oops. This property we're speaking of, I had it upside down, is right here. I'm not showing all the property, but the reason for this picture is because you can see all the massive tree lines that are cutting down towards 164th from the south heading north. Those aren't just tree lines of undeveloped area. The reason those trees are there is because those are all an extensive creek system uh, that cuts through all that acreage. All of this acreage has been undeveloped because it's been in family hands for many years in five, 10, 20 acre tracks. And now those families have begun to sell or move on from those properties as, as they were encased. But they're encircled by a very typical housing type set of additions. They're surrounded by Fenwick, Lexington, uh, Fairview Farms, a lot of housing additions who built nice ho housing additions. I'm saying in the you know, typical $250,000, $500,000 above type homes, under the belief and thought was that this area will continue to be developed like most in several square miles around it. And that is that they'd be housing additions with probably a typical commercial four corner. What came before this commission four years ago was a development of three-story uh, apartment type condominium buildings almost in the exact same layout as being proposed to you today. That fought all the way through zoning for an extended period of time and eventually was voted down by this body because it, uh, there was some concerns about the developer and there also was concerns about the intrusiveness of this type of a facility suddenly being put in the middle of all of these neighborhood areas. That developer walked away and a couple of years ago this developer stepped in. The only thing that's really changed here is the fact that now we're talking about three-story units in the same basic footprint layout that are being said 55 and above senior. I, I don't get any senior breaks when I cross 55, but 55 anyway is what they're saying. It has the same concerns. Uh, even in the last 24 hours, as our, the same engineer spoke, at another very large town hall meeting about the property straight across the street that had 100 people protesting that for the same concerns. They're on the upstream side of this. They're saying those properties are flooding. They're concerned. This same property when we came to the zoning commission and it passed anyway, we had pictures of just a few weeks ago that not only as you re may remember, the north end of this property flooded and ruined many homes just a few years ago. But now just in the last 30 days, when we had those heavy rains, that creek came out of its banks again at 164th. I had pictures I showed them where the debris, tree limbs, lots of debris damaged. There was some power loss up in there from the water damage. It, while it didn't flood that entire quarter mile section as before, it did put that section out of banks. So our concern has been we've raised many times, this area floods. There's been discussion also, which I'm sure he will speak to, that even he has said, I would really like to get a better feel of this creek because I constantly hear about this, but no one seems to really officially know about it. And all you neighbors keep saying it keeps flooding. So apparently there is an, an independent, I don't know, study being done right now that his firm or that developers for the other two areas are trying to conduct to try to address some of those concerns. But even the fact that they're doing it, plus the fact that a comment was made just last night by him to them to reassure them, don't worry about your area, water, you're upstream of this it's not a factor for you upstream. We're downstream, and that is our concern. We don't, we're tired of kind of doing vigil walks. 
we feel, ideally, that the city should officially look at this entire area because it is unique and get a good grasp on what the floodplain issue is for this area before we do any more development. The corner, PUD 1289 that you see there on the very corner, just cleared all that acreage off in the last few weeks. It's going to be typical commercial. But that was several more acres that's going to be all asphalt and concrete that now is running off. It's weird design. It feeds that same creek system. All of that water now is going into the creek system. The two more northern developments will asphalt high density complexes that are going to come before you. All of these are saying that we're really, really concerned about that creek system. Our, our, our proposal is, or not proposal, our desire of myself and many of the people who live in that area is that this commission, if we had our choice, would again vote down this because a three-story unit not only is there a concern over the flooding, that concreting that entire zone or a large percentage of it's going to even create more problems, but if that is impossible or cannot be delayed because of that, at least we'd love to see um, a compromise potential that says also take the intrusiveness of suddenly having a three-story apartment complex being built in the center of major housing additions. Okay. Because if that one does and two more, it, that suddenly becomes now a Penn Memorial kind of complex area. Okay. And it raises well, I, you've done a good job of, of making your point. Mark, thanks for coming down. Sure. Especially appreciate the, the graphics. I, I have a question on this. Is, is the zoning for senior housing, is that specific? In other words, if the owner of the property determined at some point in the future they didn't want senior housing, could they, would they have to come back before us? That's correct. It, it's a provision in the PUD. They'd have to amend it. And do we define senior housing? Do it as well, there is a, a description in the zoning ordinance, but they, the uh, 55 and over is a provision that he added okay. to his request. John? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do have some major concerns as it relates to this property. Uh, this morning, um, of course, you know, it, it was raining early, early uh, this morning. So uh, I got up uh, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and, and drove out to this particular location just to see uh, when it rains, does it flood? And that answer is yes. Uh, last night, uh, the developer uh, met with uh, this community in reference to a couple of other uh, PUDs. And we received phone calls after phone calls, emails after emails, again, in reference to uh, the flooding in this area. And so I do have some uh, concerns as it relates to uh, flooding uh, along this creek. And I'm going to ask for uh, the developer and the Neighborhood Association to try to work together and see if we can work out, see if they can work out uh, differences. And so I'm going to ask for a 30-day deferral. Uh, for this particular uh, PUD. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to defer this item for four weeks? Yes. Is that all right, John? Yes. All right. Comments or questions here? All right, cast your votes on the deferral. That item is deferred for four weeks. What will the new date be, Francis? August 27th. August 27th. And the councilman is asking if the developer in the neighborhood will get together and continue to discuss um, the aspects of it. Okay. Yeah, Brian, go ahead. Um, both, both entities, because this particular development uh, actually, the north and the south uh, have issues with it. Uh, so, um, again, you need to get with, with both entities because, okay. again, last night there was concerns from both uh, entities, the north and the south. Okay. Thank you. And we're on to item 8A12, the zoning case in Ward 1 at 10545 Northwest 10th Street. It's a simplified plan unit development. We've come a new spud. James? Yeah, it's uh, it passed planning commission. Uh, unanimously, and I don't think there's probably anybody here to talk about it, so I move for approval. Okay, there's a second. Cast your votes, and it passed unanimously. On to item 8A13, it's a zoning case in Ward 6 at 2307 North Blackwelder Avenue. It's currently R1 single family residential and an urban conservation district, and it would become a new spud. May? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Oops.
on fishing. Lost my microphone here. Um, I see that the applicant is here, I think, Sam. Do you want to come uh, talk about the project briefly? Good morning. My name is Sam. My name is Sam Gresham. I'm the owner of 400 Northwest 23rd Street. Uh, the project is um, uh, meant to be units, rental units, basically, for OCU campus students. And it has been uh, my experience that very nice buildings do very well r rental wise. They're, they're small, detached, two bedroom uh, houses on that property, or proposed for that property. The property says R1 all around it, but I'm surrounded by multifamily apartment units, either duplexes or, or fourplexes uh, on all sides of this, uh, of this property here. And it's, it's largely non-owner occupied uh, around me. And, and this will be non-owner occupied as well. But we intend something uh, extremely attractive. I'm sorry I didn't bring any of my illustrations. Uh, I don't know if they're in your packet. But um, that's OK, Sam. I just wanted you to talk a little bit about what the project is. It's nice, again, to see some additional infill in this area. And we know that, that students need good and high quality housing in the area. So thank you for bringing it to us. Um, there was an easement that I understand has been delivered. And the technical evaluations have all been approved, too. I was uh, very appreciative of the fact that you'll go ahead and put some sidewalks in on the frontage of the property, which is important along that corridor. Um, this is in compliance with the OKC plan and had unanimous approval of the uh, planning departments. I would move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second on item 8A13. Comments or questions from anyone? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Thank you. Item 8B has been deferred until August 13th. That's two weeks from today. Item 8B deferred until August 13th. Item 8C is a public hearing. This has to do with the assessment role for the Western Avenue Business District. Ed, do you have comments on this item? OK, we have a motion and a second. This is a public hearing. Did anyone show up today hoping to speak on this item? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 8D is a companion ordinance. And so, Ed, you want to make a motion on that, too? Second. All right, cast your votes on 8D, and it passed unanimously. And they're requesting the emergency. Ed, if you'll make another, and we have enough votes, cast your votes, it passes 8-0. All right, we're on item 8E. This is a public hearing also. Two weeks ago, council was uh, briefed on this item. It's pretty much a housekeeping issue. Did anyone show up today hoping to speak on item 8E? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes, and it passed unanimously. Mayor, item, item F and G both have to do with AMSA, and I did not, I should defer to it at the beginning of the meeting, but did not. Councilman McAtee and Councilman Shadid, who are our representatives on the AMSA Trust, have requested that we defer both items F and G until the next meeting. It gives us time to, to react to the bids that they received. Uh, and this is good news because it, it, it's uh, saving dollars for our residents. But we uh, got some, some bids for, from a, a new service provider for EMSA. There will be some cost savings, and we need to evaluate that and bring some recommendations forward. So we're, again, we're asking F and G to be deferred for two weeks. All right, how about a motion to defer till August 13th? All right, cast your votes. And we're voting on item 8F, and that passed unanimously. And item 8G is a public hearing regarding the ambulance code. Are we good to go on this, or we want to defer this one, too? OK, I'll put in the motion, then. Cast your votes. And it's also deferred until, item, until August 13th. Item 8H is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. We have one person that has signed up to speak, uh, Deborah Saunders. Apparently, we wore her out. She she spoke with us right before that. Oh, she did. She, she's okay. a realtor. She seemed and like she was happy. So. All right. All right. Motion and a second. Anyone else here hoping to speak under any item listed under 8H? All right. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8I is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under any item listed under 8I? All right. How about a motion? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8J is a public hearing. This has to do with the consolidated plan. Uh, Steve Rhodes is here to give us a presentation. Yeah, I'll be Steve Rhodes with the planning department. 
The consolidated plan is a five-year strategy for addressing housing and community development needs, uh, principally with uh, grant funding provided to the city through the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, the specific grant programs that are included in the consolidated plan are the Community Development Block Grant, uh, Home Investment Partnership Program, Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, and the Emergency Solutions Grant. Um, the consolidated plan is essentially implemented by an annual action year plan. Um, the uh, fourth action year plan was adopted April the 30th uh, after being our, our process is typically through a series of public input meetings, hearings before the uh, Citizens Committee for Community Development, as well as review and recommendation by the Council Conservation Committee, Council Neighborhood Conservation Committee, excuse me. Um, two uh, issues have occurred that necessitated us amending our consolidated plan fourth action year, and that uh, one of them being that the plan was developed prior to the adoption of a federal budget for domestic agencies. And so we need to, uh, the, the, the proposed amendment allocates those resources and adjusts or reconciles the differences between those that we estimated during the development of the plan uh, versus those that are actual. Actual funding announcements were made May the 30th. The second issue, and probably more importantly, is uh, that the, the uh, storm, the tornado and storm damage that occurred with the May 20th and the May 31st tornadoes. The block grant can be used to, you know, provide immediate assistance as well as long-term recovery programs for the block grant using the community development block grant program. And so we're proposing uh, establishing a program to assist those areas that uh, cannot be assisted by FEMA, principally private or drainage systems that are in private ownership. That would be one program that we are establishing, as well as increasing the amount of funding that are going to our uh, housing uh, rehabilitation programs. Um, and also maybe including in with that those, those uh, housing rehabilitation activities, uh, offering them the opportunity to also include a safe room or storm shelter. And again, we, we took this to the Conservation Committee of Council uh, at its, its July meeting, and as well as doing uh, all public notification requirements that were, were required by HUD. Steve, did, it looks to me like we got a little bit more than we estimated we were going to, is that? We budgeted conservatively, uh, you know, not knowing, you know, what the domestic agency's budgets were and also the threat of sequester this year. Uh, we chose to go with OMB guidance for an 8.2% reduction across the board uh, for block grant, home, ESG, and HOPWA. It did change. Uh, the community development block grant wound up receiving a 2% increase. Home was diminished by uh, roughly 6%. ESG was hit, hard, emergency solutions grant was hit much harder than we anticipated, uh, and, and the HOPA program, uh, it, it, it did not sustain it, quite the cut that we had anticipated as well. Okay, any questions for Steve? All right, Steve, thank you. Mm. This is a public hearing. Did anyone here hoping to speak on item 8J? All right, how about a motion to move this forward? Cast your votes, pass unanimously. Item 8K is also a public hearing. I think Doug Dowler is here to give us an update on this item. Good morning, Mayor and Council. On the dedicated police and fire sales tax, uh, we have a requirement that all the, pro all the spending in those funds be consistent with the ballot language that the citizens appro approved and that all of those projects get approval by you, the Council. And so we've got two uh, changes uh, to the fire sales tax resolution. This will be the first uh, hearing of that. Uh, the biggest one is uh, to replace and, and upgrade their self-contained breathing apparatus, three and a half million dollars. The fire department will be using fund balance that's in the fire sales tax from prior years uh, to pay for that. There have been some issues with the uh, procurement of that, but they wanted to go ahead and uh, get the approval for that. These items will then also be on our next budget amendment. So this is just to give them the authority to spend it, and then we'll come forward with a budget amendment uh, in, in probably the next month or so. Uh, that will then give them the budget authority to spend this as well. But they, they need your approval on each project that is spent uh, out of the fire sales tax. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Mm -hmm. This is a public hearing. Does anyone here today hoping to speak on item 8K? All right. How about a motion then? Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. Item 8L is a request for a revocable right-of-way permit. This is... Uh, to hold a bike OKC event September 29th. Is the applicant here? Uh, let's see. Oh, we have a couple of people that have signed up to speak. Oh, uh, nope. 
My mistake. We just have one person. Um, are you Victor? I am. Okay. Victor Manuel? Yes. We will need your name and address for the record, Victor. Uh, no problem. I was not on the permit. It's uh, Victor Manuel, 2816 East 15th in uh, Plano, Texas. All right. Thank you very much. You bet. And uh, take a couple of minutes to tell us no what problem. this event would require. No problem at all. Um, we'd like to run uh, a tour called Bike of KC. Uh, basically, it would be a tour through the Thank you, Tim. Uh, through the downtown and up to Lake Hefner, uh, around the lake, and then back to the uh, downtown area again. It's uh, we're estimating between 500 and uh, 503,000 people. Uh, it's going to be our first year running this in Oklahoma. Um, we're very uh, pleased to be able to support uh, the several of the charities that are uh, helping out the tornado victims. And we um, are requesting from the city uh, simply the uh, ability to have a police presence on the roads during the tour itself. Um, we're not asking the city for any uh, lane closures. We initially, that was our initial request. And uh, after our discussion with the uh, consortium, sports consortium, um, we've uh, corrected to uh, make sure that we're doing the a main, minimum impact. As a matter of fact, it's the exact same level of uh, participation that would be, that has been used for spin the wheels and uh, red button. But it seemed like a lot of impact. Are you, is this, it seems to me it's, this is an extraordinary the amount of streets you'd need closed for this arrest. Right, and, and that was the initial request, and that's why um, first and foremost, I wanted to um, ask that to be amended to be simply the, uh, uh, Police presence on the uh, with the cyclist and not the lane closures. We we do not wish to do any lane closures at all at this point. Okay, all right, uh, Meg. I know you know more about this than me because you were uh, serving as a council representative on the sports consortium. You have any comments? I do, Mary. If I could just maybe share with the council a little, little bit of the process that we've been through um, on this application. Um, it came before the Oklahoma City Sports Consortium at the request of the City of Oklahoma City to take a look at the event. Um, Josh, in our events department, has been working very closely with the team here to try to um, develop a plan for an event of this magnitude. And um, it was brought before the Sports Consortium about a month ago. Um, a presentation was made uh, by um, uh, one of the, I think, the founding partner of the organization who unfortunately is not with us today. Um, but following the presentation, there was a unanimous uh, recommendation made by the Sports Consortium uh, not to recommend um, this event moving forward to the city. And I, I, there were some substantial concerns really um, surrounding the, um, the magnitude of the event, the magnitude of the impact on the city. Um, as we've heard up until just a minute ago, the plan was to close about 31.2 miles of streets in the city, some of which were four lane, which might have had a slightly less impact, but some of which were two lane, which would have had a substantial impact um, on our citizens traveling around the city. And we were also concerned, and, and I want to say that the Sports Consortium and our chairman, Bob Funk, is here today, um, but the Sports Consortium is made up primarily of folks in the business of putting on significant events. and. As I said, the first go-round, there was unanimous decision made not to uh, recommend to the city uh, that this be approved. The applicant came back to the consortium, asked for a second hearing. Uh, that second hearing occurred yesterday. Um, we had a quorum at our meeting. We, um, we had requested detailed information on uh, many of the uh, questions that were asked of the group in the first presentation and um, unanimously uh, for the second time the consortium um, voted not to make a recommendation to move this forward at the city. We did not feel that the questions we asked were answered in the sufficient detail needed for us to make a decision. So yeah. that's where the consortium stands All on right. the the, This goes through five wards, so if any of the council representatives from any of those wards would like to speak up at this point. Yeah, Pat? Your Honor, just a, uh, a quick comment. I, I, I was under, I had read their old proposal that calls for closing some two-lane streets and it bothered me considerably. With the change, I'd like to defer this issue at least 
for the next meeting when we can review their amended proposal and then see if, it, if we still have questions or concerns about it. No, I think that'd be in your guys' best interest if you still hope to do this. I don't think the council's sentiment's there to pass it today. Your Honor, I would be more than happy to do that. And as a matter of fact, we could um, uh, provide a, the more detailed um, list with without the lane closures and with more detail about uh, the charities. I think um, some of the council members had asked uh, some more detail about the charities and the memorandums of understanding that we have with those groups. Does this report include that information? It does not include the memorandums. Uh, it, uh, so no, it does not include the detail of the information that uh, you might, if it's okay with your honor, go ahead and distribute that to the city council member. Well, do I, I don't have that immediately. With I don't understand. So, it, yeah. Okay. okay. So, Pat's request is for a two-week deferral until uh, the 13th of August. Is that second. date? Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any other comments or questions here? All right. Cast your votes, and that item is deferred. Thank you. Thank you very much. You bet. On to item 8M, we have three more uh, revocable right-of-way permits. The first we'll consider is in Ward 7. The event is called Tap and Run. Um, is anyone here representing that event? Is that Indeed, that yes. Okay, your name and address, please. Matt Roberts, uh, 11500 uh, Champions Way out of Louisville, Kentucky. Okay, and what, what do you have planned for? So uh, I want to give you guys a, a brief background on Jam Active, which is the company I run out of Louisville. We put on over 300 sporting events mainly mainstream athletic competitions, triathlons, half marathons, et cetera. Tap and run is about as non-serious, uh, frivolous, non-competitive event as there is. It's a very short race, four kilometer race. We've done it in 24 cities in the last 14-ish months, southeast, midwest, uh, haven't gotten too far in the west coast. But um, the crux of it, as you guys may have read a little bit, is that we serve beer in small quantities during the race in fully enclosed locations on the race route. Uh, we're doing it in conjunction with Remington Park, um, the Adventure District. Um, let's see, Best Friends of Pets here in OKC is a, a nonprofit beneficiary. It uh, really is just a fun event, and it averages around 2,000 people per event. We are not pacing to be that big here in Oklahoma City here in two weeks, but uh, either way, we understand the sensitivity of serving beer during the race, and I welcome any questions on that front. Okay, and what, what was the charity again that will be uh, Best, excuse me, it's called Best Friends of Pets. Okay. Kim Schiller is who we work with there, yeah. All right, well, it's in Ward 7. John, you okay with this? I'm okay with it. All right. Any other comments or questions from council? John, you want to make a motion then? I move for approval. Is there a second? Second. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, good luck. Thank you. Okay, we're on to item 8M2, and the Oklahoma Humane Society has asking to uh, hold an event called Midnight Wolfness, and uh, Amy... Schrodes is here. Hi, Amy. We'll need your name and address for the record. Amy Schrodes. My address is 3844 Northwest 17th Street, Oklahoma City. Okay. And this event is actually a trademarked OK Humane event. Normally, we hold it in a parking lot of a PetSmart. This year, we want to take it back to our home base, which is our adoption center at 7500 Northwestern, and do a street closure to make sure it's safe for everybody involved, because we do usually have a line of about 500 people waiting to adopt by midnight. So this time we're looking to close Northwest 74th between Classen and Western, right between the OK Humane Adoption Center and RCB Bank. I do have every um, neighbor surrounding us on board. They've signed a petition. RCB Bank will be hosting parking for us. We have two county reserve deputies on site or scheduled to be on site directing parking, um, not in the street, but just on the side of RCB Bank, flagging people in and, and getting them parked in there. And we'll have food trucks um, from about 7 to 11, and we'll also be doing a movie screening in our parking lot. So, I think, Amy, any isn't, questions? It, isn't it true last year that you uh, exceeded all um, goals set by PetSmart? I think we had the biggest yeah, adoption. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is actually our sixth event like this. Last year it was a traveling event, and we did exceed the goals. But every single year we've always exceeded the goal. This year our goal is to find living homes for over 200 dogs and cats. And all of these animals will have been transferred directly from the Oklahoma City Animal Welfare Division. Okay. Amy, thanks. It's in Ward 2. Ed, you okay with this? All right. Cast your votes on 8M2. Pass unanimously. Thank you, Amy. Item 8M3 is an event called the Mustache Bash. It's in Ward 6, and uh, Audrey Falk is here to give us more information. Audrey? Good morning. 
I'm Audrey Falk. My address is 3 Northwest 9th Street, Oklahoma City. Uh, I'm the owner of Shop Good. We have a small uh, clothing and gift shop on 9th Street in downtown. This is our fourth annual Mustache Bash. Um, it's a charity benefit block party. Um, we choose a different children's charity each year um, to raise funds for and raise awareness about. Uh, this year's charity is Citizens Caring for Children. Um, they mentor and provide resources for Oklahoma City's foster children. Um, the event will feature live music, we'll have food trucks, um, an outdoor retail market, and um, it will go from 6 p.m. until midnight. We're requesting a revocable street closure for Northwest 9th Street uh, between Broadway Avenue and the railroad track um, for that day from 8, 8 a.m. until midnight to give us enough time for setup and tear down. Um, we will have security provided by the um, Sheriff's Department and um, I'm open to any questions you have. All right, any other questions for Audrey? Quick question there. Yeah, Larry. Somebody help me out. Is a noise permit required for an event like this? We've obtained a noise permit. You do have one? Mm-hmm. And have you talked to the neighbor, are the neighbors around there? We just had an event uh, that came up uh, last, this past week, I guess, and uh, all of a sudden some, uh, a neighbor uh, complained about the noise that the event generated. Have you talked to the neighbors? Yes, all of our neighbors help us in hosting the event, so we have their signatures on the permit. Larry, there really aren't any residential neighbors uh, in the close proximity. It's all commercial and retail. Um, Unfortunately, noise has a habit of traveling, and I'm just alert to that. Thank you. It does. I'd move approval of the event. Thank you. Second. All right. Comments or questions on item 8M3? Cast your votes, pass unanimously. Thanks. Item 8N is a resolution um, that would allow our public works department to go before the Board of Adjustment, and this has to do with the, the floodplain and the rebuilding from the storms in May. Eric? Thank you, Mayor and Council. We bring for you, for you today for your consideration a special item. Um, obviously, the May 20th tornadoes in Oklahoma City caused significant damage in Oklahoma City and more. Um, over 450 homes were completely destroyed in Oklahoma City, hundreds more damaged. But what makes this a little bit different is this is the first time in, in some of our response and some of our history that we actually have homes that are in the floodway or the flood plain that were damaged. And there are some issues that have come up regarding the reconstruction of those homes. Many of you I've talked with, and I know the Councilman Greenwell and I have visited somewhat at length. Obviously, most of this occurs in Ward 5. But uh, the city currently has a drainage ordinance that does not allow construction in the floodway. I get a lot of questions, what's the difference between the floodway and the floodplain? Generally speaking, to take it out of engineering terms, the floodway is that area that FEMA identifies on a map that's a part of the National Flood Insurance Program. You hear these maps called the firm panels, the federal insurance rate map. It's what is used to determine your rates of insurance if you have flood insurance. These maps identify the area of the floodway, which is predominantly the channel of the river or the channel of the creek, and then the floodplain. And the floodplain itself is if we have the 100-year flood event, that's the level that the water rises and the area that's affected. So it's important to make that statement because we do allow construction in Oklahoma City in the floodplain. Uh, the requirement of construction in the floodplain is that the finished floor be finished one foot above the elevation as identified by FEMA. But we don't allow, again, construction in the floodway. And of the homes that were destroyed as a part of the May 20th tornado, we had 13 structures in the floodway that were damaged were destroyed. We had 33 that were in the floodplain that were damaged or destroyed. There are really no issues of the homes that are in the floodplain. We were able to work with those property owners very soon on getting them into a reconstruction mode. But the 13 that were affected as a part of the floodway, five were completely destroyed. What we're asking for your consideration today, um, as we have again had a significant outreach to Oklahoma City residents that were affected from the May 20th tornado and the May 31st storms, our outreach center has been open. This will be one of those final acts that, uh, that we would ask to have you authorize um, me as city engineer to make an application to the Board of Adjustment, waiving our drainage ordinance, allowing for construction in the floodway for those five homes that were completely destroyed. So these are homes that had existed. Um, this is not new permits. Um, it would be um, also subjected to certain requirements. And so one of the reasons this has taken so long for us to consider, we entered into an agreement with FEMA a number of years ago that we would follow our drainage ordinance. 
that we would make sure that we prescribe by the rules of the National Flood Insurance Program. And had we gone out early on this, we might have subjected those ratepayers higher rates of insurance because we didn't follow public policy. Um, we currently in Oklahoma City have 5,900 properties that are in the special flood hazard area. They're either in the floodplain or the floodway. 2,600 of those are insured. So as we consider these five properties, we wanted to make sure that we were protecting all those that either currently had insurance or would be seeking insurance, making sure we got the best rates possible. Well, I'm happy to report to you today that uh, two weeks ago we did receive the confirmation from FEMA um, from Oklahoma Floodplain Managers Association that us taking this action would not alter or subject our current rate payers to higher rates. So that was a very important item that we needed to secure before we could bring this to you to council today. And again, this would allow me as city engineer to make application to the Board of Adjustment for those five properties in the flood way, granting them the ability to reconstruct. There's a application that would be signed today. There's a special Board of Adjustment meeting that's been tentatively scheduled for mid-August. Um, and that would be the meeting at which they would actually take that formal action. And if granted, we could then start issuing building permits in that area. Now, there are a couple of final things as I'll just kind of close this out for questions. Those homes can't be built any larger. Um, they already had an impact to the floodway. If it was a 2,200 foot house, it can't be built larger than a 2,200 foot print. It also has to be elevated to the current requirement. It has to be one foot above the base flood elevation. So several of these properties are going to have to raise their finished floors. Um, they're also subjected to the floodway rates. And so we'll be working with them very, very closely. Um, but again, I think as we work towards the reconstruction out of the May 20th tornado, this is one of those last actions as we reach out from the city to try to get our residents um, moving forward again. And with that, I can answer any questions that you might have. Let me see if I get this straight. So these homeowners built the property under the standards of the day. The federal government changed the standards, uh, changed what the flood zone requirements were. Those homeowners were grandfathered in because they were existing homes. Then those homes are damaged, if not destroyed, by a tornado. Those people would like to rebuild, but now the new regulations are come into play. And this would allow uh, our public works department to work with these homeowners and figuring out a way they can rebuild in that area and meet the FEMA requirements. That's correct. And it's a complicated issue. Um, the National Flood Insurance Program yeah. did not even come into um, play until the late 70s. And so a lot of these homes were built prior to the implementation of the flood insurance program at all. A lot of the homes that we've met with these owners have been in the family for 50, 60, 70 years. And so that's one of the issues that's come in is that there's well, new requirements. So we're trying to be the ally here Absolutely. of the homeowners that want to build it, even though we are requiring them to, to do something they didn't have to do before. And uh, it's a city ordinance that was, was adopted by the city. And so, again, this would be waiving that ordinance requirement for those five. And it would be a one-time waiver. We would not allow new construction. They can only rebuild what they lost. It's just ironic they weren't destroyed by a flood, you know, with that, that, you know, the, the, the floodplain's trying to protect them from. Uh, okay. Um, I, I yeah, a, go ahead. I have a question. Uh, Eric, on the uh, size requirement, to go back in with the same size house that was originally built, that essentially precludes the owners of those properties from improving their property, making it bigger or changing the, uh, the uh, design of the house? We've been approached by one of the owners that might go two-story. That's an option. But the footprint can't change. Um, but they are allowed to go to the second story. There is the opportunity for them to build a second story. And it would not just apply to the home. If they lost a barn, um, the same would apply to the barn. The barn can't be any larger. So it's whatever the structure was lost can be replaced. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. David. Your Honor, uh, I just like to uh, thank and commend Eric and his staff for this hard work. You know, when people lose uh, their home, uh, their emotions really uh, usually get elevated, and uh, Eric and his staff has had to deal with that, and he's done it in a, from my perspective, a very timely uh, manner, and uh, it's just been a little over two months since the tornado came through on May the 20th. But to those who were impacted, it seems like, you know, two years, I'm sure. So uh, I do want to thank Eric and, again, the staff and the city for their efforts to be accommodating to these uh, homeowners and yet also protect the rights and, and uh, protect other homeowners from a, a significant increase in the cost of insurance moving forward. So I think everybody wins in this situation. And uh, I know, as Eric pointed out, 
several of these homes have been in the family for many, many years, and it's, it's really important to allow them to continue to uh, live there. So, uh, again, thanks, Eric. You want to make a motion to approve yes, this? Yes, I'd like to uh, move that we approve this motion. Sounds like we're doing the best I, we can I got do. One, I got yeah, one question. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm not an engineer, so you said that uh, these five houses will be required to raise their floor up some. Is that going to affect any of the other homes that are in the flood plain? It won't. It okay. won't. And, and again, the um, elevation requirements is for that. The lowest level of the home just has to meet a minimum elevation just so that it is not, um, so that its risk of flooding in the future is the least possible. So it's all, it's all predicated on the 100-year flood event. Um, and it, again, it's to reduce their chance for flood, even though this had nothing to do with the flood in this instance. One of the worst things that could happen is they have these highly impacted folks go out there, house destroyed by a tornado, rebuild in the same place, and then the next year be negatively impacted by, by, by a flood. And so we're trying to make sure, even though it's the, they have to do some things, it will protect them in the long run. Yeah, Larry? Eric, I, you mentioned I can uh, build a house in the floodplain as long as I adhere to these uh, standards. You can. Uh, the city does allow construction in the floodplain as long as you meet the requirements, yes. Okay. As a, as, a, as, a, as a home purchaser, am I required to be told that this is in the floodplain? Uh, I got a call from a citizen out in your area, Dave, who claims that she just built a house and she was never told, and now she's finding out it's in the 100-year floodplain. Yeah, I think the, the biggest question that I think we find that comes up is uh, there is not a requirement for you to have flood insurance as a homeowner. But if you do have a mortgage on your home, most lenders do make a requirement. So I think a lot of times what we find is a homeowner may be in construction of a home, maybe they just recently bought a home, weren't aware of the requirement and they're finding that out at closing. Um, they find out at closing that they're required to have um, hazard insurance for flood. And I think that probably catches several by surprise. You know, there's not a requirement, um, you know, for the city to participate in the closing process. These firm maps are available online at, at uh, FEMA.gov. Um, they're actually called firmettes. Most mortgage companies um, will print those maps as a part of the closing process to make homeowners aware, but I don't know that all of that occurs equally each time maybe a property transaction is, is done. Why wouldn't that be caught at the time of a building permit? Why, why couldn't we catch that? You know, it is checked as a part of the building permit, um, but typically you have to realize it's a builder that's coming in making the request of the plans. Sometimes I don't know that the homeowner's involved in the actual plans process. So it's contractors that are coming and they're making sure, of course, city staff is checking that the finished floor requirements are met. I don't know that that's always told to the homeowner. We don't meet with a lot of homeowners in that case. But generally the mortgage company checks, picks it up on it. Right, okay. All right, Eric, thanks. Appreciate your work with these people. All right, we have a motion and a second, don't we? Okay, we're voting on item 8N. Cast your vote. Pass unanimously. All right. Item 8O has to do with an item that was deferred four weeks ago on the wellness centers. We have a number of people that have signed up. And I, I think uh, we have representatives from three uh, respondents um, or potential uh, uh, operators of our wellness centers. We appreciate all of you being here. I know all of you also uh, accompanied our trip uh, on, on the bus to Little Rock and uh, our, our chance to see a, a wellness center in action uh, in North Little Rock. So appreciate uh, all your concern. I, I thought it'd be good just because this process has been going on so long that the city manager kind of bring us up to date. And then uh, we have a number of people that have signed up to speak and we'll let each one of you speak. This process has been going on for several, year, several years. Uh, we've tried to define what the project should be through the, our, our program uh, managers. We, we've brought a consultant in to help us assist on this process of, of, of culling out what we're trying to, to achieve. Um, then we put out an RFP, gosh, I don't know how long ago, a year ago? Quite a while ago, and uh, did not get satisfactory responses from that RFP. And so we rejected those uh, proposals at the time and had a series of meetings with stakeholders. I, I think 30 some meetings that were held with stakeholders to, to get different inputs and try to help them educate us and, and, and help us educate them as, as to what we were trying to achieve and what, what was out there. Uh, we did put out a request for proposals again uh, several months ago. We received four proposals at that point in time. Um, through the, the selection process, they were, they, were, uh, they were called down to three in which further uh, presentations were made. And at that time, there was a recommendation from the selection committee to go with two proposals. 
And this is where the process becomes a little unique. I've never seen anything quite like this before. But we came out with, with the recommendation to go with, with two proposals to go with City County Health on their campus up on uh, Northeast 50th Street and with Putnam City Baptist Church on, on, on their uh, campus northwest. Um, all of the four, by the way, proposals uh, were to have those their wellness centers put on their campus, whatever, whatever, whatever uh, of the proposers uh, campuses uh, deemed to be. Um, and then it went to the MAPS subcommittee uh, on wellness centers, and at there the first the first vote was a was a split vote. It was a tie vote, and so it ultimately went forward, I believe, with a recommendation for one or two, for one, for one. Uh, the, the city county health facility, and then it went to the full MAPS board, and it also had a split vote, tie vote on it, but ultimately had a recommendation to go with with one to city county health, and then it ultimately came to, to this board uh, uh, four weeks ago with that recommendation. The council modified it at that point in time to go with the two, and then deferred it for a month. And I think it's really important to point out how the proposals have matured with time. I think, I think this has been a good process for getting uh, proposals. I think the proposers, uh, through the process and through the questioning that they've gone through, have become more focused on what they're trying to achieve. I think in most cases, the subsidies have gone down uh, for, for, for city support. And each of the proposals are unique. They, they, don't, they don't attack life the same way. And that's not bad. They're, they're, they're all different. But all of them have gotten better as, as time goes on. And now it's time to make a policy decision as to, as to which, which direction the council wants to go forward with those proposals. All right. And can I just, just one comment? And that, that's, that's where I think maybe we're, we're jumping the gun a little bit. I think that in terms of the council, and I, I appreciate the meetings that have taken place over the last four years, but the fact is that four of us on the horseshoe were not present during MAPS 3, so we weren't present in any of the, those deliberations. And, and since that time, there really haven't been, there hasn't been a public vetting among the council itself as to policy, as to, to justify government intervening for, on, in terms of health and wellness of senior citizens, there has to be a purpose. And one way we got in trouble with the boulevard was not specifically defining our purpose and need. So what, it's clear to me, we, we meet as groups of four, to, we don't want to violate the open meetings record. So four of us have met and, we, and we've vetted this. It's very clear to the four of us that met, uh, Pat and, and James and Pete and I, that there was not consensus among the, the council as to policy, as to what problem we're trying to solve, as to what, uh, what is the policy. And it was very, it was clear that we had not vetted this over the last uh, three years. I think we've heard time and time again from the consultants and from the subcommittee that about the, the big binder and nothing being under the Senior Health and Wellness Center binder, that there really hadn't been vetting. There, hasn't, there was no direction from the council. And part of the problem that I think we find ourselves in today is, is, what, is uh, what problem are we trying to solve? I think that our seniors uh, in Oklahoma City are in trouble. It's not a typical situation like other cities. We rank at the very bottom on so many, virtually every adverse social and health index for senior citizens. They rank at the very, very top, the very, very top, for example, for prescription drug abuse. So some of the highest rates, not in the country, some of the highest rates in the world. Two, two thirds of every ER visit, for example, of a senior citizen walking into an emergency room in Oklahoma City is alcohol or drug related off the charts in terms of depression, mental health issues. And one thing that we know from the literature is that if you don't address these mental health issues, you're not gonna get the physical health improvements. It's not a matter of simply having a place where seniors like to exercise. It has to be a comprehensive uh, wellness approach, I believe. Uh, and, but those are exactly the kind of things that I'd like to see vetted. Uh, of those, I think there's only six of us who've heard the hour-long presentation of all three. Four of the six feel that North Care is the, is the best proposal, or at least as good as the other. Three of us, I think, hands down, North Care is the best proposal. And I know that Meg just met with North Care maybe three or four days ago, and David just met 
and Northcare yesterday, and three, Pat and Mick and Larry, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, have not had the opportunity yet to meet with Northcare. So you have half of the council, at least four, who think the Northcare proposal is the strongest or meeting the needs that they feel uh, the policy uh, should be aligned with. A another, another issue which, which has not been vetted is that with veterans, and we're very, I'm very honored to see General Aragon. Uh, we have changed the scope of this now. This is now for 50-year-olds and, and more. This is no longer just for senior citizens. I don't think you can define senior citizens as a 50-year-old, so we're moving the bar. That means that a large number of veterans are, are either eligible for this now or are on the way. And, and I can tell you that there is a storm brewing, not just with our Vietnam vets, not just with the way the VA is being overrun, but with the large number of, of, of vets that, are, have, that have served three, four, five tours of duty. Uh, they and their families have special needs. And I think we need to hear what North Care could potentially offer our vets. Uh, and we have not to date. So the clear consensus of the four of us that met that morning was we should defer this for not a long time, but for one month and have a workshop and hear about the specific epidemics of public health that our senior citizens face, the problems that need to be solved, vet that among ourselves, come up with a clear purpose of, and need and policy objectives that we can then share with the, with the consultants and with the applicants and then make a decision. And so that, that would be my, my preference, is that, go ahead. My colleagues bring up some interesting points, but North Care is not on our agenda today. And, and, and uh, the fact that we don't consider it today doesn't mean that it's been turned down, it's just not on the agenda. We've got two uh, proposed locations. And during the course of our initial discussions, and Ed, you were not privy to these, we recognize the fact that they all may provide different services depending on the demographics of the community that they're serving. And the second thing I think is important to recall is that these were not social service entities. We were not trying to solve everybody's social problems. We were to provide some facilities for the, well, for the senior citizens who are interested in that to take advantage of it. We weren't trying to solve everybody's problems. And I, I'm really concerned this morning. I thought obesity and diabetes were my only two worries, and I've got a whole list of things to worry about. <laughs> Oh, good. It's, but I it's, think it's important that we, we have a, this viewpoint, but I think we need to go forward with it. We've got two good applications in front of us this morning. Mm -hmm. And I think we ought to consider those two applications. Uh, not just discarding, not saying that North Care is going to be eliminated or not considered, but it's not on our agenda this morning. But it's a policy, it's a policy statement to say that you're going to go forward with those two as opposed to the other one, which is going to address other issues. Which one do you do first? What public health impact are you trying to make first? One out of every four senior citizens in Oklahoma has an alcohol or drug abuse issue. One in four. One in seven have a depression issue. One in five have an anxiety disorder. I just would like a, at some point, which we have not had, a public vetting of what the most pressing issues are because I think that defines which senior wellness center gets built first. What impact do you want to have first? Well, Ed, I don't think anyone's saying that those mental health concerns can't be met at, the, at whatever facilities we open up, and they should be. I, I don't think this is a vote about mental health. I think we all recognize mental health is underfunded in this state. I would love to have additional conversations about how we can fund mental health, but I think that's a separate conversation. Well, I, I think that the three that have not had a chance to hear the North Care proposal should be able to meet with them, and you, and you haven't yet, but I think you might, after you meet with them, feel that there is quite a difference in ability to meet those needs, to meet the needs of veterans, to meet mental health needs. I think there is a, a wide gap between the North Care ability to meet those needs and, and even the other two. I, I don't think that you can treat mental health the same at all three facilities. It's very different. Yeah. Mayor, if, if I could perhaps respond, um, Ed, to some of your comments about not vetting this with the citizens and not vetting it. You did say that you weren't here when the MAPS uh, projects came forward, and, and that is correct, along with some of your colleagues. This was vetted with the voter. The concept of a senior wellness center that focused more on wellness and socialization, if you will, which is also a major issue with seniors. I think if we go back to the roots of depression and alcohol dependency and drug dependency, a lot of that is loneliness. 
and being shut away. And so the opportunity to provide um, a wellness center was widely discussed. And, and I'm gonna speak from just personal experience. I was one of the folks that went out and talked in the community and not just in Ward 6, but community-wide, the community groups about what these senior wellness centers were. And following Pat's comments, I, I don't think they were viewed as a social service agency. I believe they were viewed more as a community center. And I would agree that we've got major issues, and I think we can address a lot of those. I so appreciate Rita being here, representing the veterans, and Randy and your whole organization. Your proposal was extremely well done. Um, as a resident of Ward 6, or as a, as a campus located in Ward 6, I'm so proud of what your goals are. And I, I think a lot of the things that Councilman Shadid is talking about are things that you had already planned to address outside of the Senior Wellness Center. Um, and we're, we're not, as Councilman Ryan said, suggesting that a proposal can't go forward. But my opinion is we're ready today to move forward well, you know, with the, the two that have been selected. The deferral four weeks ago barely passed, and I voted for it with the understanding, if not the assumption, that we'd be voting today. Um, so I'm, I'm just speaking for myself here, but that was my impression. And we've got a number of people that want to speak. I understand, so. everybody. I, I, we'd have to bet this today. If we're not going to bet it in a separate meeting, we're going to bet it today one way or another. I mean, somehow or other, we're gonna, unless, you, unless you kick me out of the meeting, we're, we're going to talk about it because the idea that we're running out of time is not good enough for me. I mean, I, I'm not, I, I'm, I, I have some comments too. With regard to whether it's vetted beforehand, I was here beforehand. I don't believe it was vetted beforehand. I believe it's a watercolor beforehand that was vetted by the Chamber of Commerce in some commercials they produced. It was not vetted in terms of actually how we're gonna do it. I, I, I would just disagree that it was vetted. I think the vetting process has occurred though. I don't think we did, at this point, we don't need to say it has not been vetted because it has been vetted through the RSP, RFP process. But we've, never, we've not, as a group, looked at the policy that the, that, that vetting has, has brought to the surface. I will tell you, for one, I'm somebody that's kind of changed my mind. I had kind of an idea that it would be a community center, um, uh, but there were a number of things that have happened since then. The first thing that happened was we ran into the requirement, and we didn't talk about this beforehand. We ran into the requirement, requirement that it had to be on city-owned property. So when you start building million dollar, multi-million dollar facilities on other people's property, you are betting that it must succeed. Because if it fails, your investment is zero. If we spent, build $10 million in the middle of the Putnam City Baptist Church complex, and that doesn't work out, for whatever reason, it doesn't work out. We are stuck with a building in the middle of a church complex that is worth nothing. We couldn't, we couldn't the, the legal ramifications of trying to figure out how to run it, who would, who, how we would get our money back, could we sell it, they're, they're off page. So the first thing I think that we've discovered through this vetting process, these facilities are not going to go where we in thought they would go. The only way they're going to go where we think we thought they were going to go was to build all of them on city-owned property ourselves. That's the only way it's going to happen. Now that that forces us to revisit the subsidy issue. And if and, but but if we build them on, if you build one at Woodson, if you build one at uh, uh, Will Rogers, if you build one at uh, in the uh, Lincoln Park area, and you build one at say Schilling. Uh, where you already have centers, all those have subsidies of small, albeit small, but they have subsidies. We're running them now. So there is, that, that solves two problems. That well, it doesn't solve the subsidy problem, but it, but it certainly is a, is a down payment on the subsidy. But it, cre it does not create this, what I can see as a terrible problem in building these, all three of these, on properties not owned by the city. I, I just think this idea that we can go back and get this lease idea, or um, it, it's not going to work. I mean, it, it, it's not any. We, we do not. We're not guaranteed the continued operation. And so we we go for these proposals. We get four proposals, and lo and behold, because of this process, they're all in North Oklahoma City. One of the things we talked about when we asked to 
when, when we put this on the agenda, was this is going to be the first way that MAPS actually reaches out into the community. This was the first pro set of projects that put MAPS outside of downtown Oklahoma City. And this, and this vetting process has proved this method is not going to do that. It's not going to put it out into the community. If it is, it's only half the community. I mean, we haven't had one application. The only applications we looked at, uh, which, which is ironic why some of them didn't go forward, but the only application we looked at went walked away because of the uh, city-owned property issue in one case, and another case was we didn't think the demographics of the neighborhood were right. Now we're talking about two, pro three projects that we're building them in, in situations that are none of the, which are city-owned property. We have one, we, we're, one of them, the demographics of the neighborhood are virtually identical to the one that we said we didn't like the demographics the last time. I, I think we, I, I agree with, with Councilman Shadid. I, I think an honest, open, four hour long discussion with everybody listening um, is a way to, to get to the bottom of this. I just don't see how we can just say, we're going to go on and ignore what we found out. Secondly, it's a little disingenuous to say that North Care is not on this. The church wasn't on it two, a month ago. It came forward to us with only one on it. We immediately amended it that day to put the church on it. When we, so you can't say, well, we got to do it now and only we, we, got, we leave North Care out because we just changed that four weeks ago. When, when three of you, three of us, I think, or at least two have not sit down with them and talk to them at North Carolina, not even seen their proposal. We're going to decide today that that proposal is not adequate or the others are so much better than a project you haven't even seen. I, I think we owe it to, we owe it to our own integrity to hold some kind of an additional meeting that is focused just on this alone. Because the location part is, is going to be driven by the decision we made earlier, and I will tell you, I own that, I have to own it. I was one of the people that said no subsidy, no subsidy, no subsidy. But what the no subsidy thing has created is this, we lost total control of the location. And if we're not gonna have them, if they're not gonna answer the question that we were trying to answer, which is when is MAPS gonna leave downtown and, and show something in the, into the neighborhoods, then none of these projects are worth doing. Right? Mr. Mayor, um, I'm going to add my two cents on putting on uh, the religious hat. Um, I'm a person of strong faith and conviction. Um, but what concerns me in this whole process when uh, the city went back out for uh, the second rounds of RSV, RSVPs, uh, there were individuals, I, I want to say maybe uh, 15 entities uh, that certain people went out and talked to about this senior wellness center. Uh, of that number, uh, only one church was reached out to, and that was Putnam City uh, Baptist Church. Uh, I have some strong uh, concerns with um, reaching out to one church ver versus the whole faith uh, community. Um, we uh, totally left out our, our brothers and sisters from the Jewish uh, community who have uh, deep pockets. Uh, we left out uh, out uh, a whole lot of other uh, faith-based uh, entities. We went to one church, one church. Um, and, and I raised the, the issue of the whole faith entity uh, piece. Uh, again, I, out of uh, no offense to anybody on the city council, but I probably attend more uh, church services uh, across uh, Oklahoma City because my work ward is so uh, diverse but again we went, reached out to one church in this city one church and i i have a huge issue with that because uh those people who went out to talk to these different 15 different entities uh they didn't include not one african-american church i'm gonna bring that up not one african-american church and that bothers me we went to one church one church only. Then the second piece. Uh, John, John, who went to a church? Well, we received in, in the briefing that uh, there was 15 different entities that was talked to. Let me rephrase it. 
uh, that discussion took place. But I mean, we uh, didn't, and, we and, didn't am I go wrong? out to and, any churches. They came to us, right? Well, yes, from, from the presentation I thought that, that was given, there, they listed 15 different entities that they had discussions with. Right. But we didn't go out to them. I mean, they... Uh, they well, we probably met with them after they requested yeah, that we, we meet. They responded to the RFP. We didn't but, seek them but out. But how, okay, how, how many people, and this is a question of different pastors in Ward 7 came to me, we didn't know anything about it. So I, I, I think we're going to have to figure out different ways to get the messages out about the whole RFP process. Then I look at, okay, city-owned city land versus leasing. Uh, and I agree with uh, Councilman uh, White uh, when it comes to uh, that, that issue. So I have some major reservations. Of course, North Fair proposal, by far to me, was the best proposal. Uh, and I, I do want to give city county uh, credit. Uh, we, I think we are working on uh, uh, working out differences. I want to thank uh, the leadership at city county health department, but North Coast proposal by far was the best. They are the only entity that talked about measurements, that talked about accountability. The only entity, accountability, measurements. Uh, so I do believe that uh, as council, we need to come together uh, and figure out what are we doing with these wellness centers? Because at this point, I don't think anybody knows what are we doing with these wellness centers. I mean, if I could make a comment um, about the locations, um, because I think, um, Pete, I don't think intentionally, but I, I think we've left an impression that these are all downtown locations. And of the three applications that we got, the only one that's remotely close to downtown is NorthCare's application. And before I continue, I fail to recognize Commissioner Terry White. Thank you, Terry, for being here. I really appreciate it, and I understand you made a great presentation when I was out of town, and I very much appreciate you being here today. Um, but the locations of the two that we're looking at currently are far northwest Oklahoma City, and they're northeast Oklahoma City. So we got three applications. Two of them are in two other quadrants of the city. And, you know, I think it would obviously behoove us going forward that we try to solicit some applications from South Oklahoma City. But the current um, responses to the RFPs are not in downtown, uh, other than General Pershing Boulevard. Well, Frank, we have one proposing that's closer to Piedmont than is downtown Oklahoma City, another location that's closer to Edmond than it is downtown Oklahoma City, and the one that only identifies with downtown. I mean, so, okay, they're in three different quadrants, three different areas, but I will tell you there's not one of them south, not one of them south, not one of them near northeast, not one of them near northwest, where you have huge populations that are in need of this kind of service, a lot much greater than the areas where all where at least the two farthest north ones went. Well, except so we, that our planning it. department, I My mean, our own city we, planning department, cited with, without regard to the RFPs, drew a map of where the greatest need they thought these sites were. And the Putnam City Baptist Church site is dead in the center of it. The city county health department has a green dot on the map right where it is. City county health statistics have been published for years say there are two areas that in need service. One of them is closer in northeast and the other was closer in southwest. This idea that now we have this terrible poverty problem in at 115th and Rockwell to me is just absurd. I mean, that, that, but we're not talking about that, poverty. We're talking about serving seniors across the board that makes my for point. wellness. That makes my point. We have, this has morphed from what it was to what it could be. And I think a lot of us would like to at least bet what it could be. Larry, you want to say something? Not really, but I'm going <laughs> to. Uh, I was on the council when MAPS 3 was brought to the voters. Uh, there was a considerable amount of documentation, in my opinion, and I'm going to speak just from my opinion, so I'm not discarding what anybody else has to say, about what a wellness center could do for senior adults. And I was given some literature from people who had been involved in uh, putting together the MAPS 3 initiative. And I was asked, could I support this? And after looking at it with respect to the wellness centers, my conclusion was, yes, I can. And based on that, 
I put my personal integrity on the line, and I went forward wherever I was asked, and I answered anybody who came to me, what is a senior wellness center, and what will it do? And I believe, in my mind, that is the model which I'm intending to see developed to start the wellness centers here right now in 2013. Geographically, we were, we were talked about four wellness centers that would be spread, spread around the community. We didn't know where. They would be, in my opinion, I maybe stepped the line here, southeast, southwest, northeast, northwest. The exact location was not known. We were looking for a partner to run it. The original model was we would build the center, we would equip the center, and a partner would be found to operate the center for the benefit of senior adults. There was discussion what was a senior adult. The discussion varied between 60, 55, and 50 as far as years. 50 meets that criteria. The uh, responses to the proposal that we've gotten in, in my opinion, meets the approval of putting locations in Northeast and Northwest. Those are two of the four quadrants. Uh, I did not sit in on the meetings that uh, were, were held, Ed, but uh, I can read. I just got through reading significant proposals that uh, you'll hear about in a couple of weeks with respect to uh, ambulance service. I've read the proposals, and in my opinion, the, uh, the proposals that came back from City County Health and from uh, Putnam City Baptist Church, if you will, met the intent of what I believe the wellness center was supposed to be, a community center to gather and to provide a service for senior adults. That's my comment. Thank okay. you, Mayor. James? Yeah, I have no idea where to start, but I'll just kind of dive in. Um, I agree with that last part, that last part that Larry said. I think that whenever I, how I view these projects is um, I just want, all three of the proposals that I've heard are good and fit into my mind of what I pictured these things being. All three are slightly different. All three are, have a lot of commonalities, though. And so I, I think that um, to stop now and to not move forward and to defer it again is not a good idea. But I do think that having a workshop talking about just because our conversation usually morphs into other projects. You know, it doesn't just, it's not just uh, um, limited to the wellness center. And I think having a public uh, workshop where we talk about the wellness centers, because I mean, this is just moving on to negotiate with city staff. And so there can be many, many changes uh, from here. It's not like it's, it's not like it's done, a done deal. So, so I would definitely be in favor of actually voting on th these two today and including North Care in the conversation down the road. Okay. That, that's, how, that's, how, that's where I stand. I appreciate that, James. Anybody else before we start going through the, the list of people that have shown up here to speak? Okay. I, I, I just, I'm stunned that planning, just, just one, one other issue that we have got to continue to vet is the transit component. That, that planning would come up that, that you would put city infrastructure, $25 million of city infrastructure, miles and miles away from transit lines in one case and a good half a mile away from another, that it would rank. We, we cannot do that. This is, to put senior wellness centers along transit lines is not just to get people to the senior wellness centers. That's how you improve your transit line is because you've already made the investment on that transit line. So for not $1 more, you get more ridership on your transit line because you're putting city public investments along your transit line. We have to do that to get ready for the 21st century. You cannot continue to put, we just got through ridiculing the Social Security Administration for putting their building on 122nd and Kelly. And now we're, we're talking about doing the exact same thing. Even if one day you got a dedicated funding source for transit, even if you got massively larger amounts of, count of money to, for your transit system, it's not ever going to be enough if you're putting your city's investments far away from your transit line. There will never be enough money to get to all the places you need to get to. You have to strategically place 
your city's large investments, infrastructure investments along transit lines. And we haven't talked about that, and I just, I'd like to throw that out there. Thank you. It's a good point, but I think we ought to put this, these centers where the people are rather than the transit. We'll eventually get transit systems in that area, eventually, I hope. But right now, we ought to go where the people are who need these services. And in, in the examples I saw, the demographics indicated that there was a need for these services. I'll, be, I'll, I'll admit right off, if, if Council Mike's getting ready to jump on me, that uh, when we first put this together, I didn't think there would be a need for this in the far northwest quadrant because it's a fairly affluent uh, area of Oklahoma City, and I, uh, there are lots of other opportunities there. But having seen the demographic study that the proposer did, I think there is a genuine need for this facility where it's being proposed. Now, I, Pete's got some interesting comments on the difficulty of having a city-owned property someplace is not under the city's ultimate control. We can address that issue in the contract negotiations. That's not a big issue at all. Pete seems to think it's important, but it's, it's interesting, but it's not a big issue. We can address that issue and deal with it when we negotiate the contract. All right. I'm going to call people's names, and if well, they'll come I up. Think, I would think we could do that if we demanded that they pay us back the money. That's the only way it's going to work. It's not a little issue either. To own property in the center of somebody else's property is a little deal. It's not a little deal. I mean, anybody that knows anything about property law will tell you that's a big deal. So the only way you can negotiate that is if they're willing to sign a contract that says if we build it in the middle of their property, they'll write us a check for the cost to build it. I guess we could do that, and that'd make it a little deal. That, I mean, that is a big deal, but what are, we're wanting private entities to run it. So I, I don't see a way of doing it any other way, I mean, if we're going to do it that way. Well, I believe one of the three has said that they would manage it on, on city land in another location, perhaps at Will Rogers Park, and we can hear them. They're, North Care is the only one who said they would consider on city property away from their campus. Okay. Scott Hamilton, and as Scott makes his way up to the podium, he's not making it very fast. Uh, I'll ask people to keep their comments to three minutes or less. And apparently Scott stepped out. So I'll go to the next name, Jim Huff. He's not here, at, apparently. Um, and Jim, if you give us your name and address for the record, please. Well, my name is Jim Huff. I live in Ward 5, uh, 6912 South Harvey Place, Oklahoma City. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilman Greenwell, uh, council members, Mr. City Manager. Uh, I don't speak for the uh, City Council very often, but I've been down here on several occasions but this issue is extremely important. The things you have raised this morning show uh, travel, location, even scope of what's being discussed is, it's very, very big. And I wanna make sure that you don't get us into a bind with legalities, uh, especially with the church and state issues. Uh, my understanding is that Ryan Kiesel from the ACLU spoke earlier uh, and raised some questions about future uh, legal questions that might have to be answered. That's not my scope this morning. The issues that you raised are not my scope this morning. But I do see the issues that you raised contributing to the issue that I'm concerned about. For over 50 years, I've been an active participant within my Baptist faith tradition. I also taught for over 30 years in the Oklahoma City Public Schools. My area was social studies traditional social studies classes, American history, world history, et cetera. But my favorite classes were religions of the world, sociology, and at that time, Bible history was in the social studies department. And uh, all of those subjects are still extremely important to me now. I'm active in both ecumenical Christian activities and in interfaith non-Christian communities. The city must be very, very careful how it presents to the public what this concept is and for who it's going to benefit. The faith areas that Putnam City Baptist Church raise uh, are very serious. 
I, I'm not familiar with all the things the city has done in the past with congregations, but what we're doing now with a wellness center is something brand new and you're gonna be setting a precedent for other things. This proposal, in my opinion, is very bad and it has the potential to create ill will within the city. It has the potential to lead to unnecessary lawsuits and it has the potential to create an impression of either religious bias or religious preference. I suggest to you even this morning, the opening prayer, which came before the body was called in order, but it's still, if you go back and look at the various uh, city council meetings, it's usually a Christian minister that is doing the opening of the invocation. That's, th this is no longer a predominantly Christian city. It's multicultural. There is a growing Muslim, there's a growing Sikh, there's an interfaith alliance is getting very, very uh, big in the city. So there are some very serious issues there. Way back in my high school days, in my local fundamentalist Baptist congregation, the young people were told many, many times, just because it may be legal, may be a legal activity, that doesn't make it an okay activity. Jim, I got a lot of people to hear from. Could you sum it up for us? I only have about three minutes. It's been four. Four already? Then I'll skip to the main portion here. If you would pass these around. I'm going to highlight some things. The sheet that I'm handing to you has yellow highlighted. That's, that's just to separate one group from another. It's not that they're more important. But these are issues in the proposed uh, proposal from Putnam City Baptist Church. Uh, this Healthy Living Incorporated uh, board, which is going to be created. I'm not quite sure, again, as uh, Councilman Shadid has suggested a policy, I don't know exactly how you're going to deal with that particular board, and it only has one member from the city. Uh, yeah, Jim, we're board. not going to be able to go through each of your points here. About, uh, I think your major point. Well, what about life coaching? Um, what, I'm, what I'm saying is the issues, and I'm using quotes from their proposal, and I'm hoping that all of you have read the, the material and are informed with it. But this life coaching, are they gonna be talking about being opposed to death panels? You know, they're here, Jim. You could, you could ask them these questions. A good deal. All right, thank you for coming down. What, what uh, about this Butterfield Foundation? Uh, I, I know this is not dialogue. We're not here for dialogue. And I, but I wanna raise the issues that I see in the proposal. Yeah. Jim, and I hate to cut you off because you're making some, some points that are probably unique to the audience and you've, you've waited here almost three hours to make them, but I've got a lot of people so that I want to So you're saying from. that I've had how many minutes? You, 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 you've, you've had your share, but I appreciate well, your comment. But it was three minutes. I mean, I didn't it, clock myself. It, it was sure quite it was a bit more than that. Went by in a hurry. Uh, uh, Brady Henderson. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'm a lawyer, but I'll try to be brief anyway. And I'll actually state uh, for the record, today is my 33rd birthday. So I am about three decades away from being able to call myself a senior, though I suppose it depends a little bit on the measurement that was talked about earlier. Likewise, uh, my diet and exercise habits are so poor, I would never deign to presume advising anyone on wellness. So I'm not here to talk about the policies behind the Senior Wellness Center. I'm not an expert on those. I am, however, an expert on constitutional law, and particularly on the areas of separation of church and state. And one of the proposals to be put forth today raises some very serious constitutional questions. And while they may not be questions that are comfortable for us to deal with, we have a choice of either dealing with them now in a collaborative fashion, or potentially dealing with them later in court, dealing with them later in ways that are destructive to the city's goals as a matter of course, that mire both the city and Putnam City Baptist Church in unnecessary litigation. My uh, executive director, Ryan Kiesel, spoke to this body recently about many of these concerns, and hopefully all members of the council, as well as you, Mr. Mayor, received our letter Monday. What it does is flesh out some of those concerns and make recommendations if the council is to proceed with Putnam City Baptist Church, that is, if the staff is allowed to essentially negotiate, there are serious concerns that need to be addressed. What we would recommend is not proceeding with negotiations at this time, but rather more properly vetting these proposals, making deferrals, so that the city can begin negotiations in a better capacity. Particularly, I want to echo the comments made by Councilman Shadid, Councilman White, but also by Councilman Pettis. 
this, the concern that we raise here is not necessarily merely that there is a church involved in this proposal. That does not in and of itself create any establishment clause issue automatically. The problem is the preference to one church, one congregation who essentially is in a position to use tax money to build what is ultimately a church building as well as a public facility to alter the requirements of its use for the city in preference to the church itself. That is a serious situation, and in fact, it brings about the exact issues Councilman Pettis spoke to. We're talking about one church, one faith community, and one denomination within that faith community receiving a preference in use of that facility. It's not good government, it's not prudent government to go forward without serious changes to that proposal. That's what we recommend, and we're happy to offer our assistance as well as others in the community that look at these constitutional issues for the council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brady, thank you. Uh, Wanda Joe Stapleton. Good morning, Wanda Joe. Good morning, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Wanda Joe Stapleton, former state representative, House District 93, 425 Southwest 51st Street, Oklahoma City. Uh, and I still have, from my days of lawmaking, my copy of the United States Constitution. This document makes a clear statement about the separation of church and state. In the First Amendment to this U.S. Constitution are the words, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. And I still have my constitution from the state of Oklahoma, which says no public money or property shall be used for the benefit of any church. Therefore, the city council's dealing with any church is unconstitutional on the level of the U.S. Constitution, on the level of the state constitution. So I urge you to honor our founding documents and defeat this measure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Wanda Joe. Randy Tate. Good morning, and thank you for letting me speak. Um, uh, I wanted to um, address uh, any questions that you might have about our proposal and our interest in this uh, development of a senior wellness center. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, address uh, the first uh, thing I heard uh, Councilman Salyer saying uh, pertaining to the way it was, uh, the project has been vetted uh, regarding the senior wellness center and the socialization component to it and that that might be the understanding of the public regarding uh, these centers. Um, I want you to know that our particular project has all of those components. Uh, it just has more added on. It's sort of like you're looking at three cars. They all have tires, they all have um, uh, power steering, power brakes. Our car just happens to have navigation and cruise control and some extra features. I don't think that it's a rational argument that the public would not want more um, for the same offering. Uh, additionally, I want to point out an, uh, um, that our proposal is my understanding is the only one that didn't ask for an operating subsidy on top of uh, the uh, building cost and construction. And I think that has to be important to a great number of folks in Oklahoma City who vote. And additionally, I think it's very important that um, our proposal reaches out to the veteran community and provides a place for them to have not only socialization, uh, but also services that they need all um, together. So anyway, I'll just uh, allow you to ask questions. Randy, are you willing to operate one of these off your campus? Am I willing to operate it off the campus? Uh -huh. Uh, at Will Rogers, I would be. I, I prefer uh, my campus, but if, if that were the only way this is going to be um, offered to North Care, I would concede to that. What about South Oklahoma City? Um, that would not be uh, something I could do, I could agree to on the spot because I would need to work that out with 
um, several collaborators, and that actually falls out of our main collaborator, collaborator Variety Cares service area. No, no, it's not Variety Cares. I would still need to run it by the uh, collaborators. Okay. <clears throat> Just follow up on his question. I would be very interested in your answer specifically to Woodson Park. I don't even know where Woodson Park is, <laughs> and I apologize about that. I wasn't prepared for that question. All right, Randy, thanks for coming down. Can, can I ask you, Randy, a question about Surely. the veteran component? Because I, um, my, my medical practice now is almost all combat vets at Fort Sill and their families. And we, things are getting away from us in terms of substance abuse. One in four suicides in Oklahoma is now a vet. Um, as, as many of them approach being med boarded, there's kind of, there's a sense of urgency that they're going to lose choices. They're gonna lose options in terms of where they get medical care. So we try and get as much done uh, before the medic, not, not to take anything away from the VA, which, which, uh, I, which does wonderful work. But what vets seem to want is diversity of choices. They want, especially on the mental health side, to be able to talk about things like substance abuse, to be able to talk about some things in confidentiality outside of the VA system. And so can you talk about what you may be able to offer our vets in terms of services at, at a, it not, I mean, we say senior wellness, but now we're talking about 50 years old and older. Right. Well, first of all, I think the, the, the primary component that everybody agreed to uh, or is looking at that Arkansas model for socialization and the reduction of isolation, we certainly are there with that with the vets. Um, we, we are talking about peer programs and uh, recreation programs and programs that reduce their isolation. Uh, we also uh, have the ability to plug them into mental health substance abuse services and all the primary health uh, care, dental, vision, et cetera, that we've proposed in our project. Uh, and uh, NorthCare already currently has specialized programs for veterans, and that is, that is why we've reached out to them. That, that is an important target uh, community to NorthCare, and I believe vice versa. I feel like we have gained the trust of the veterans community, and um, and we are an option to the VA for them. Well, Randy, may I just ask a quick question about that? Because when you and I talked last week, we did talk a lot about the veteran component, which I think is incredibly important. But you are moving forward, speaking with the VA, separate and apart from the wellness center. Yes. Isn't that correct? So, you know, I think, what, what, I'm ex what I'm hoping for is that as you develop the campus, it will include that yes. component. However, I think that the Senior Wellness Center is appropriate for the veterans and is um, an important signal to, from the city of Oklahoma City that it supports veterans. I don't disagree with that at all, but I just want to be clear. Yeah, there and, is a but conversation it, here, here's on. the difference. This makes our service offerings to veterans far more robust than North Care's resources will have otherwise. And I think that's an important consideration. And one additional thing on location, while I would be open to discussing as a last resort, perhaps Will Rogers Park or another location, the one thing that I think is very important is being right in the center of the city as an early, uh, early project uh, is, is very important in particular for, for veterans and other uh, uh, entities that would be coming from all over the city before the others are built. Thank you. Rita Aragon. I was afraid you were going to steal all my thunder before I could get it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor and City Council. It's a delight to be with you today. And to, I get the honor and the uh, responsibility of representing 350,000 veterans in the state of Oklahoma of which almost 100,000 live in the metropolitan city area. And there are many of them who do not qualify for VA benefits, for health care, for medical, uh, mental. But one of the things that I do know about NorthCare, because I have worked with them on at least three different occasions and three different models, is that they look at mind, body, and spirit, which is what the military talks about constantly, of the whole person concept. It is much more important than just one of those elements. Now, back in the old days, the guys who came home who were veterans started uh, uh, the American Legion and the VFW and all that, but 
th less than 4% of our veterans actually inhabit those places now. Part of the reason is because many of them don't want to go in a smoky environment. They don't want to go where alcohol is the predominant uh, equalizer. So many of our veterans do not participate in any of those areas and do not qualify for VA benefits. So I would very wholeheartedly recommend and endorse North Care's program. We've seen it work with our veterans. They have a high level of credibility with our veterans. And I think that starts off. Now, obviously, I'm only looking at one segment of seniors. I qualify whatever age you want to use as a senior. I, I think I've got that one covered. But the truth is that it is about bringing people together to keep us all vibrant and viable. And, and hopefully, you all will have that part of your consideration. Thank you so much for letting me be with you today. Thank you, General Aragon. Uh, Dan Strawn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of the council, my name is Dan Strawn. My business address is 1724 Northwest 4th Street. Um, I'd, I'd like to just take a moment to speak on behalf of uh, our partners, North Care. Um, I uh, first became involved with North Care in 1998, so it's been 15 years, when North Care was asked, implored, really, to take over the financially troubled community counseling centers. And speaking as a uh, former banker and a former United Way executive, uh, my experience with North Care throughout our 15 years is that they are one of the most fiscally sound, financially prudent, competently managed businesses that, that you will run across as a potential partner in your senior wellness centers. Um, leaving aside competent business practices, North Care is also one of our most forward-leaning uh, mental health and wellness providers in the state, and, um, they, and they could not possibly be a better partner for you in terms of service provision. So thank you so much for your time this morning. Thanks, Dan. Oh, Ed Paluto. Yeah. I didn't recognize he was in the room. Major Paluto, good to have you back. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, uh, Council, I want to thank all of you for your support and for always taking care of me and my family and making sure that we weren't left behind on the field of battle. I am here representing um, the veterans, uh, as you've heard, but also North Care's proposal. I work with an organization called Folds of Honor Foundation, which provides the spouses and children of the fallen and wounded educational scholarships. And to date, we've raised over 25 million and awarded over 5,600 scholarships in that six years that we've been in existence. But I also had a calling in life to create another organization that would take care of the veterans in our local community in a different way. And so we created Warriors for Freedom Foundation. Our president, Brett Dick, is here to provide mental and physical and holistic support to our nation's heroes and their families when they come back from combat and or are here in the home front. As part of our program, wellness is a key aspect of what we do. Because you see, we take the veteran, we assess them, and we provide them the services that are rendered to make sure that they understand that they could have a great quality of life. And for us, our outcomes are measured by the fact that how do we place our veterans, and more importantly, how do they become successful citizens within their local community? And so I am here to basically advocate for this partnership that we have with North Care, but more importantly, to tell you that we are going to bear resources to support this effort for our veterans that are seniors and create a peer-to-peer -peer program utilizing Vietnam veteran era vets and teaming up, up with the new veterans that are coming back. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your commitment. And I'd like to see this happen for our community so that we can be the best that we can be. Thank you. Ed, thank you, Major. How much money have you raised in the past? With Folds of Honor Foundation, I said 25 million. We're on pace to raise 40 million here in this next year uh, with about 13 to 14 million dollars coming in this year. 
And then Warriors for Freedom, in the last year, we've been able to raise $500,000 and are moving forward and raising money to provide services for many areas. And NorthCare is one of our partners. We also fund the Homeless Alliance and their veterans programs. And so my job is to go out and find the money from other sources across the country and bring it in here to our great community. So do you think donors would be willing to support vets at a, at a veteran programs at a senior wellness center? I, I would believe so just because the, it is a best practice. And with the outcome measurement piece and the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services and all of these other partners from the community, Variety Health and others, what we've created is a safety net or a one-stop shop for making sure that we could take care of a lot of needs in this community. Okay. Love to work with you on that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Major. Thank you. Terry White. Good morning. morning, Commissioner. Thank you. My business address is 1200 Northeast 13th Street, but I'm a resident of Ward 6. So there are two pieces, actually there are a ton of things, but you've given me three minutes and I know how important that is. So there are two things I really want to address with you today. The first is the idea of a community center location. And I actually didn't know a lot about this location when this first came up and when I was approached about this. So I got taken on a little tour, thanks to someone who's willing to drive me. And General Pershing's is going to be your gateway to the state fairgrounds of Oklahoma. Not only is it going to be there, but there is a charter school who is willing to invest and is planning to invest $40 million, already purchased the land directly across the street. This is going to be an area incredibly important. But probably the most important thing about this area is you all want to address wellness, is what I've heard you hear it say clearly. This is located in the zip codes with the highest risk of health issues. And coming from an agency, and I appreciate actually what the mayor said very much earlier, coming from an agency that's incredibly underfunded around mental health and substance abuse needs where we have to make very tough decisions, locating this in these zip codes of the highest need ought to be at the top priority for anybody, at least that is for us when we decide where we're gonna put our services since we can only reach one in three Oklahomans in need. And I think that has to be considered. But the most important thing I think I can bring to the table in discussing this today is to say, you all say you want to address wellness. And when you talk about this proposal, you call it a social issue. That's offensive. Mental illness and addiction are diseases like any other disease. It's time that they're treated like that. This is not something different. When we're gonna talk about the issue of diabetes, of obesity, of those things that people struggle with, as long as we continue to miss the boat that these are diseases like any other disease, in fact, the most important organ in our body, the brain, and we call this a social issue, we've missed it. And we've missed it for families that struggle every single day who sit in front of me. And the reason that I was late today because I was at a suicide prevention council meeting, listening, or a, a, a forum, listening to Major, and I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with him, if Major General Graham talk about the loss of his son to suicide and why he's dedicated his life to this. And as long as this keeps happening, we're gonna miss the fact that the highest risk group for suicide is men over the age of 65 in Oklahoma. Who do you think we ought to be targeting when we talk about wellness? And what issues ought we be talking about? One in four of our seniors struggles with mental health and substance abuse issues. A disease, part of wellness. And what we know is that if we don't address mental health and substance abuse issues, and this is not my opinion, this is research over and over, if you don't get to the heart of that when you talk about wellness, the rest of the health outcomes will not improve. If there is untreated mental health and substance abuse at the bottom of this, the rest of these wellness issues will not improve. So we have to get this whole picture, and what I would urge you to do is consider that when you think about all of these proposals, because I don't think that you, you this was really taken and thought about when this was talked about overall wellness. My guess, and it is no fault of anyone's except our society in general, is that we always leave out mental health and substance abuse issues, and I think that's why people were so strangely responsive to this particular proposal, because we've missed the boat on that. But we can't keep missing the boat for the citizens of our city. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Bill Fleming. My name is Bill Fleming. I live at uh, 12436 Hidden Forest Boulevard in Oklahoma City. I wanted to address a couple of issues. Uh, the ACLU and others have spoken about the church state issue. And one of the things that we've tried to do is address all of those issues in the smaller meetings that we've had with each of you. I would tell you that uh, there will not be an issue because uh, Healthy Living and Fitness Inc. will be a 501c3 nonprofit. It will be governed by the Board of Directors and run by the Board of Directors. 
The members of Putnam City Baptist Church, the leadership have already been told that they will have no control over it and they will have uh, no way to exercise any control. So that's a moot point, I believe. And we'd be happy to negotiate with you in, in, any, in any area that we need to to clarify that. Secondly, I'd like to speak to uh, Councilman White. Uh, he made the statement that this would be in the middle of the Putnam City Baptist property, and uh, that simply is an inaccurate statement. It will be on the far northeast corner. It will be an acreage that will be sold to the city. It's a very valuable piece of real estate. It has frontage on Rockwell, and it would stand alone from the church. If for any reason that it wasn't operated as a wellness center, the property would probably have as much value as any other piece of property in Oklahoma City. So I wanted to make sure that uh, that, that was clear also. And then this, the issue was also raised about uh, South Oklahoma City. And, and believe me, I believe when this proposal was put forth for wellness centers in Oklahoma City, the citizens of Oklahoma City thought they were going to get one in each quadrant of Oklahoma City. I believe if you went out and did a survey or a poll, that's what you would find. If you want to make sure you get one in South Oklahoma City, you need to do an RFP specific for those areas, and then that way those proposals will come in. I believe our proposal is an excellent proposal. We're concerned about all aspects of health of the citizens of Oklahoma City, not just physical, but mental and emotional also, and we will work to address all of those needs. I think that uh, the issue also was raised about it being on a transit line. And public transportation is great. The truth of the matter is very few people in Oklahoma City use it. When we visited the Rogers Center, when we visited the Little Rock Center, very, very few of those people use public transit to get there. They come by car or by some other mode of transportation. And so what I would ask the council to do today is to move forward with negotiations with the two as on there with one change on that uh, item and that that would be that the negotiations be with Healthy Living and Fitness, Inc., as opposed to the entity that is listed there, and that is not a subsidiary of uh, Putnam City Baptist Church, as noted. And we will do everything in our power to make this a successful center. It is right smack in the middle of one of the biggest senior populations in Oklahoma City. There's a tremendous need there, and we can fulfill that need and make it, I think we can make it a model for everything else. And I also appreciate all the efforts of North Care. I, I, you know, I would love to uh, see that move forward and, and hopefully the, that'll happen because I appreciate what's going on there. But we think that uh, there needs to be a, a senior center in Northwest Oklahoma City and we need to move forward on it now. Thank you. Can, Thank can you I ask this. one question? So one, one thing we've heard today is that if you don't treat diseases of the brain, then the rest of the body is not gonna follow. If you, do, if you have diseases of the brain that are untreated, then you, people either aren't gonna come to exercise or they're not gonna get physically fit. So how would you address the, the one in seven seniors that have depression, the one in five that have an anxiety disorders, the one in four that have a substance abuse uh, or prescription drug issue? How, how would your center address those, we talk, and, and suicide as well, how would you address those diseases of the brain? Well, I think a, a, a big component of depression is, uh, particularly with seniors, is the fact that their social life just kind of dies. and They don't have the interaction. They don't have the support that they need. So I think having good social programs would help in that respect. As to those other issues, I'm not a medical expert, and I would have to defer to your expertise or someone else's expertise in that area. But we would certainly be open to trying to find a way to work that component into our programs because we want to serve all the needs and make sure that all aspects of wellness are, are addressed in, in that. And if I uh, would be happy to work with you or anyone else to see that that happens. Well, what, what would you think of the commissioner's comments that maybe socialization is not the, the sole issue? That's not the solution to depression, anxiety disorders, substance abuse. It's simply getting people in a social environment. Well, I, you know, I think there are all kinds of factors there that I'm certainly not qualified to speak to or address as well as the, some of those underlying causes. The only thing we can do is, is look at what's out there and as best we can structure programs to try to address those issues and working with the medical, the medical community, which we're still working with uh, the different hospitals. I've, I've talked to the board of, uh, members of the board of directors at Integris. We've talked to the executive director at uh, Mercy and we'll be talking to others to try to bring them in as additional partners so that we could continue to address all of those issues and certainly mental health is one of those we'd like to look at. Will you have a a board member that's also on salary? In other words, your trainer, I believe, is your trainer gonna receive a salary and be on the board? 
I, at the time that we put him on the board, we thought uh, that uh, we did not anticipate doing that. As a plan developed, we recognized we're going to have to pay him to do training for life coaches and things, so we have uh, advised him that he won't be able to serve as a board member. Okay, and I know that you met with the mayor on Thursday and, and you talked about several things. One thing that I believe that was brought up was the number of people that voted in favor of MAPS 3 in different parts of the city. And, and, and you pointed out, I believe, that, that a high number of people voted for MAPS 3 in that area. Do you think that should be a consideration? I'm, I wasn't at that meeting with the mayor, but what, what's, the, what's the rationale for? O only from the consideration that because those people supported MAPS and got out and voted for it, I think they would also support the Wellness Center there. It's uh, not to say that because there were a lot of votes in Northwest Oklahoma City, that would be, you know, a deciding factor, but we do think it indicates uh, involvement and for people to get out and get involved and support the Wellness Center. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, David. Mr. Fleming, uh, this morning we've had a lot of focus on mental health, and again, I agree. I think it's an important uh, part of the overall wellness program for seniors. Would your organization be willing to work with an organization like North Care or some other mental health organization and make that a component of your services to the seniors? If North Care would like to come out and join us in that location, we would welcome with open arms. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Uh, John Pettis. Yeah, we won't start the clock till you get here. How's that? Okay. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members morning, of the John. City Council. I'd just like to make a couple of uh, observations regarding this RFP. I think this council needs to uh, move forward with this issue that's on the agenda today, but I'd like for you to consider two things. Number one, in looking at, I've read all three proposals and I've looked at the proposed budget. There's some things I think in this process that the council can tighten up. Number one, uh, the first center has more money than the last center. And it's based on, according to the RFP, the timing of the projects being built. Also, the RFP requested basic services to be within the, uh, the center. If that is the case, could they not use the same uh, drawings and rendering of the buildings? Because if not, you're paying for architects four times. Uh, thirdly, I think that in all of these proposals, and I think all three of them, if only two is accepted today, then I would hope that the <coughs> North Care be on the next council agenda item to accept it. In all of these three proposals, I think the city should buy the land outright from each one of these entities and build their own facility and let these, even on the same site, just buy it from them and then let the, uh, the, the organizations run and manage the facilities. Um, and I, oh, the services that uh, North Care proposes to offer some of the other, the other two did not offer those services, but I would hope that all of these organizations have the same goal in mind in providing the services, and I would hope that the three organizations, once they're selected, can get a collaborative effort and work together to perhaps offer the same services, because what you don't want to happen is the services that needed, uh, let's say, in Ward 7, they have to go to uh, uh, North Care South to get those same services. And if those organizations can have a collaborative effort, then hopefully the services would be offered for all of them within the same city. I didn't give you my address, but it's 1332 Northeast 54th Street, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And he didn't know I was going to Thank you, John. Um, I called Scott Hamilton's name earlier and didn't get a response. Has Scott stepped back in? Okay. 
Okay. All right. Do, uh, do we have a motion? Well, can, can I just ask, Mick, can you, I mean, we've heard from everyone uh, except you. I know you speak across the country about wellness. Four weeks ago, you called this proposal extraordinary. Can you share with us what, what makes it extraordinary for you? What, how, how your decision making between the three? Well, do, do we have a second on the, on the, okay, we have a second. And, uh, I'd, I'd like to offer an amendment to the, to the motion that we include all three We're just for, this is just for negotiation process. North Care is obviously the most prepared. They're not having to say, we'll modify our program or we'll do anything. They're obviously prepared with a program that could be put in action right now. I don't know why we can't consider all three of them at the same time. I, you know, we may have because in, as we your colleague, Dr. Shadid, pointed out, so several of us have not heard their proposal yet. If we, during the negotiation process, it might be well that all of us avail ourselves. Well, I think we ought to do it before the negotiation process starts. That's just an opinion. I, I, I think that we amend it to include all three. Um, is there a second to the amendment? Second. All right. Um, we want to vote on the amendment then? The amendment is to include all three in the negotiation process. Can, can I? Uh, make a comment before we vote on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's not directed necessarily at North Care, but it does look like we are getting close to accepting two uh, facilities and uh, all three are located in North Oklahoma City. Uh, North Care is two and a half miles from Woodson Park and I'm just concerned or my belief is if we selected the location on Pershing Avenue, that would throw out Woodson Park, given its close proximity. And that's the third of three potential partners that have been excluded from Southwest Oklahoma City. So I could not vote for North Care at its current location. Thank you. Okay. That could be part of the negotiation. Right. Let's, um, well, let me ask, answer Ed's question first. Um, yeah, I was disappointed the first time we put out the RFP that we didn't get the responses that we'd hoped for. We thought we had worked with partners. We thought we were going to get responses. We thought the RFP had been crafted um, um, that we would get multiple responses. And then we didn't. And so, uh, you know, at that point, I think, you know, the, the, kind of the, the disappointment grew. And we thought, well, we need to look at this more closely. Let's, let's, let's talk again. What are, the, what are the, the hurdles? Why are people not responding? And then we put out a second RFP, and you know, all of a sudden we get um, you know the ones we suspected we would get, but then we get new proposals, ones that uh, you know, frankly, I didn't see coming. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll admit, when I first saw that a proposal was coming from a church, I thought, well, that's weird. You know, who? I didn't see that coming. And you know, the more I thought about it, the more I was least open-minded about it. And then when I met with uh, the people at the church, I just felt a high level of confidence that they could pull this off and to meet the expectations that the citizens had when they, when they voted this in uh, four years ago. Um, the City County Board of Health uh, proposal, it's different. You know, I've, been, I've been working on their, on their wellness efforts here for, for quite some time. We're trying to work on that lowest performing zip code. Um, the needs and the offerings are gonna have to be different. They're building a campus out there. Um, I think in both cases, we're fortunate to have uh, partners willing to offer the level of care, and you know what? What I what I try to place on in my decision making in, in this effort is, we hope that these wellness centers are around a lot longer than any of, of us are on the council, and so you know the, I, I think we have to take a great deal of responsibility in making sure that these things are set up appropriately at the front end, and that we think these people can responsibly uh, grow these programs in the future. You know, we want these to be successful 20 years from now, you know, not just on day one. And we know the demographic changes that are coming to this community and we're gonna have more seniors and the, the needs are gonna grow. And I, I think this meeting is a great example of how we've identified uh, a lot of needs. You know, we brought in veterans, we brought in the mental health issues, which are incredibly large issues in this community and every other community across the country. 
But I didn't hear anything today that doesn't make me think that those needs can't be met at any of the facilities, and hopefully, the, you know, the, ultimately, the four will be built. Um, I am, am not necessarily tied to the idea that we have to wait years before we start looking for number three. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, to start talking, because it takes a long time to get these things done. I don't think we ought to sit around and, and wait for a, a, a South Oklahoma City proposal in years from now. I think we ought to immediately start conversations and see you know, who might be interested and how we can start working out the, the process. And uh, under the uh, kind of the experience we've had that it takes longer than you think uh, to get one of these on the ground. So I hope somewhere in there I answered your question and I think we ought to vote on the amendment. Uh, Pete's made an amendment, it's, it's been a second, and the amendment is to uh, uh, begin negotiations with all three. Let me speak on that. All right. We are, if we don't do this, we are, we are excluding only proposals that meet every criteria that we ask for. The only proposal that meet every criteria is North Shore. The, other, the, others, the others didn't. The others have had to amend their program, and for the most part, they've amended their program after they learned what North Care did. And we're, if we don't do that today, if we don't include North Care, we're doing that today. North Care vetted the other two programs for them. Now we're talking about substance abuse. Now we're talking about that. That was in their program to start out with. Mental health, that was in their program to start out with. Veterans, that was in their program to start out with. So now we're letting North Care's proposal, which we've decided is not as good for some reason as the other two, be pushed to the side. And we're going to consider two others that had to learn from North Care's proposal. Where one of these proposals is from an entity that I'm not sure if they have their 501c3 now, it's a miracle. I've dealt with the IRS for a long time, and I, I would find it very difficult. I, I'd, I'd like to see the IRS approval if you have it now, because it's not that quick. The process, as a, and David can tell you. So we're we're, we're talking about a, we're talking about an entity that's not even formed yet, that only today first acknowledged that it wasn't a subsidiary of a church. That that's been the language on everything we've seen, a subsidiary of the church. I don't know where that language came from, but only today has anybody said it's not a subsidiary of the church. I think if we, if it's negotiations. Why not negotiate with everybody? Why not, and certainly, why not negotiate with the one that had the best, most rounded package when we started out? All right, the amendment has been seconded. Won't we can, vote on the can, amendment? May I ask just uh -huh. one question? Pete, will you help me? Um, you know, this, we're talking about Ward 6, which obviously is incredibly important to me. Will you help me by not um, saying that this is the only one down, I mean, that it's downtown. I mean, we're really working hard here, I think, to be able to spread these wellness centers that, that people have looked for into four quadrants of the city. And um, I, I want to be really um, mindful of that for our citizens. And what I hear a lot around this horseshoe is that everything in MAPS 3 is happening downtown. And there's some opportunities here to do things not in downtown. So. Um, I, I just want to be really clear. This is a great proposal, and I believe it is. I spoke earlier. I don't like any of the locations. Okay. I think all the locations are a mistake. I think they ought to be where I said they. I, again, to quote my friend, to quote my friend Councilor McAtee, I know where they ought to go, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> but that's just my opinion. I could tell you where they ought to go. They ought to go on city-owned property. Larry, Larry, do you want to say something about the amendment? Uh, I, I just like to explain very briefly my vote. I'm going to vote against the amendment. And for this reason, the uh, committee that was originally charged with the responsibility of uh, evaluating the proposals rated uh, the City County Health and the, Baptist, uh, the uh, Putnam City Baptist Church as equal and North Care for their reasons less than that. That's one reason I'm going with. The second reason I'm going is because I uh, would really get excited about approving an addendum that will goes out for an RFP that specifies the location in South Oklahoma City, and uh, in the answer to the question that I was given uh, about uh, Woodson Park and North Care, I took it as a very emphatic no, no way, and so uh, that, that shuts the door there, which I'm not willing to shut right now, and that's the reason. I'm for the veterans, I'm for mental health, and I'm for that, and I really don't want to debate my answer. Thank you. Okay. Well, what, what, one more comment about that. That's, what, that's not what North Care said. That's not what they said at all. They said if that's the only way they could have the facility, they'd, be, they'd, they'd entertain that. 
So that's what negotiation's for. If you'll note, these four things that I've talked about, not one of them are in my ward. I've, I haven't been provincial about this at all. Not one of the four are in my ward. I'm not arguing that you ought to put one at 134th and Henny Road, which is comparable to 114th and Rockwell. I'm, t I'm saying they ought, to be, they ought to go where the needs are. And the needs are in the four parks that were designed 100 years ago or 80 years ago by this city to serve this community. That's the four places to put them. Right. But but we but I don't see why if it's a negotiation process, why can't we ne negotiate with all three of them? Why would we just exclude one, who is is the only one? I'm saying it for the 18th time, but they're the only one that met all the criteria right off the bat. Everybody else had to modify their criteria to some, come somewhere close to what North Pier's proposal is. I haven't got into all the concerns I have about the church's proposal. When, I think you do start to cross the church and state line when you close it at 5 o'clock on Wednesday night. I mean, why do you do that? Why do you do that? That's a, there's a religious, there's nothing wrong with doing it. If you, if you own the building, if it's all your money, if, if it, it was a, donated to your church, but if you're using my money and you're going to close it at 5 o'clock on Wednesday night because you have a church service on Wednesday night, I got a problem with that. I got a problem with it being closed on Sunday for that reason. There are there are Jewish people in this in this community that Sunday is not Saturday. It's Sunday. And I just I think all those questions need to be addressed, but I don't see any reason why we can't do all three of them. If if we're gonna do two, the committee only the committee actually only recommended that we do one. We amended that to do two, so we can amend it. We can amend it and do three. And in fairness, I think we ought to. All right, we're going to vote on the amendment. Uh, cast your votes on the amendment. Meg, did you mean to vote for the amendment? Yes, I did. Okay, so the amendment uh, is to entertain. entertain all contract negotiations with all three. Yes. Okay. So do we need to vote on the issue as a whole? Yes. Okay. So the amendment is now uh, on the uh, on the dais. I'm amazed. So instead of the two that's on your agenda, now it's to enter negotiations with all three. Is there any discussion? Your Honor, I voted against the amendment because I have not heard North Park's proposals yet. And as Pete pointed out, the other two proposals were modified after we had a chance to, to hear them. And there's no indication in my mind anyway that North Park would be any different. North, North Care, I'm sorry, North Park. I'm sorry. North Care would be any different. We would listen to it and maybe suggest some changes. I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. Well, if it's still okay to comment, uh, I think this morning certainly has demonstrated that uh, there are still questions or different opinions among the council and uh, based upon these questions and concerns, uh, again, and I'm still being driven by my concern over kicking out the third and only other alternative Southwest Oklahoma City and that's Woodson Park. So I'm gonna vote no for any further negotiations with the hope that we vet these issues further uh, that have been raised. So it's not that I'm against any particular one, uh, but I am concerned about South Oklahoma City at this point in time. Thank you. David, if I thought I could get five votes for that, I'd vote with you, but I don't think there are five votes here. I think we'll move forward with what we have. Well, let's ask, because I, I, that brings us back to where we very first started, was let's, let's vet all this. It's a five-four vote. It's clear that there's a lot a policy decision and discussion that, that needs to be pl take place. I mean, these projects are moving as they, uh, they're evolving, all, all of them but are evolving. Ed, and I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, I just don't know what to suggest as far as a form to, to work through those issues is all, I'm, I'm just raising that point. Ed, I'm not gonna vote to delay. I think we need to vote. We need to move forward with the negotiations with these things and get one or two or three of them moving. It's uh, time Jim, to get moving. How, 
Can you give me a sense for how, how long would you expect contract negotiations to take? And would there, be, would there be a reason why you couldn't have some kind of workshop or just a way for the nine of us to get together and not have these meetings of four at a time? Could we, could we still do a workshop and continue vetting these things while contract negotiations are ongoing? Contract negotiations, I'm sure, will take several months. Okay. So, so there'd be nothing to preclude us continuing to have the discussion and vetting these issues in a workshop forum. I don't think anyone's against having a workshop. Okay. Well, I, I heard that a couple of people were. Well, yeah, I mean, so, it depends on the schedule, who can be there. Okay. Um, All right, great. I guess I'm unclear right now what we're going to vote on today, if anything, on these three. Right now, it, we have three of them grouped yeah, together. I, 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 I mean, I, Maybe the city manager should, but I feel like we're ready to vote on entering into negotiations with all three of the entities that are here. It feels to me like we're negotiating to build two in northwest Oklahoma City. Well, That's what it feels like to me. Well, and if it feels that way to the mayor, then I would like some clarification because we're going to be negotiating that. And some clarification yeah, I, I on that issue would be I'll helpful. I'll get this instruction to negotiate with two. I, I, I never had the understanding that if we negotiated with uh, both city, county, health, and, uh, and of church, that somehow you were going to that was going to necessarily, either one of them was going to lead to a contract. Not necessarily. I mean, so there's still need. issues out there. Certainly. There's still issues out there. Okay. And I, and I don't think there's any reason to, I just, I, I, this is just sticks in my mind. Why would you exclude the one that meant the criteria you said that time. over and I know, over again. but why Why then but, are we trying well, to throw them out? Well, I'm, I'm, I don't trying, to, I'm trying to figure out what, we're, what the message we're giving to, to staff go. here if we start negotiating with two in one quadrant. Can we call it central? <laughs> yeah, well, and, and you know, I think what we're voting on is that all three are good ideas. Yeah, I think yeah. so. All three are good ideas, and so we need to move on with the uh, well, to, to, to start negotiating I, I, and actually yeah. figure out which ones we really want what, like that, you know, I mean, there, anything can change. So. Putnam City Baptist has told us that they're going to work in negotiations to address the ACLU concerns. They've, they've just today said that they, okay, they, they thought that they could have a trainer be paid a salary and be on the board, and now they've figured out that they can't do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's things that need to be figured out that either are or are not going to be acceptable to the parties that are being figured out in real time in front of us. I mean, we haven't figured out all these things. I have a hard time understanding how you can negotiate with an entity that has to be a 501c3 that doesn't have their application cleaned yet. It's not, it doesn't happen that quick, David, does it? You get one in a week or two weeks or a month? No, it, it takes about, uh, at a minimum, well, I don't know, three to four months. At least. But, but you, the service has said, uh, and it's a stated uh, position on their part, you can act as if the no, it, that the organization has received its tax exempt status unless you have reason to believe otherwise that it, it doesn't so you can negotiate with it. I mean, legally it's an entity. It's been formed through the state of Oklahoma. Right. It just hasn't received its tax exempt status from the Internal Revenue Service. So the service says you can make contributions to them at this time, claim a deduction for it. Uh, but, you can negotiate with them. I mean, they're a legal entity. Don't you have to make an application for that and then get a letter back from them that says that? That's yeah, a Form 1023. Yeah. Yeah, Let, let's talk about <laughs> other things that are more pertinent to what we're talking about. Could I just uh, introduce Yeah, you? Larry, go ahead. Francis, correct me if I'm wrong. We had a motion in a second to negotiate with two entities. And then Councilman White brought up an amendment to add a third entity to that, which passed. So therefore, can we not just go back and vote on the original uh, recommendation with, with the amendment in there, which would, which would in effect direct staff to begin to negotiate with three? Yes, we can. Exactly. I'm just trying to, I, to me that sends a very confusing message about asking staff to negotiate with two partners in one quadrant of the city. It, it sounds as if we're going to build two in northwest Oklahoma City to me. You know, it sounded to me like today we excluded Southeast Oklahoma City because we didn't vote for maps. I mean, come on. I mean, uh, Pete, stay on the, stay focused. No, I'm, I'm focused. I'm focused. This no. is, this, we're just, we're looking for every way in the world we can do to kick out the one entity that was qualified. Every time, every argument goes back to that. 
And I think that's ridiculous. They're qualified. Why not? We can negotiate with three people. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not hearing the same things you're hearing. Yeah, Larry? Uh, I, that's, that's where I think we are. And so I think a simple call to question with the amendment is what we need to do. And Mayor, I think I caused some of the confusion here uh, with my vote, and I, I do think it's important. We're not saying at this point that we're going to build any one of these three. We're moving forward to say staff enter into negotiations to discuss further these three proposals and see if they can meet the criteria that we've set forward okay, to but do. It, it, staff could come to an agreement with all three, and they're going to bring it back to us. And, and we're going to have to decide how that fits. And so then we're going to tell someone who's made an agreement with staff and, and has a deal that we've decided not to do it. Well, it sounds like we're going to be part of the deal. I mean, we're going to be part of helping to craft the deal. We had a call on the question, so I think we have to address it. Okay. All right. Um, so a, a yes vote on, on this will in, in trust staff to begin negotiations with all three of the groups that we've been speaking about today. Is everybody clear on that? All right. We have a motion and a second. <coughs> Cast your votes. And it passes uh, eight to one. On to item 8P, understand we do need executive session? No, not on P. Oh, not on P. We do not need it on P? <laughs> no. Okay. How about a motion then uh, to approve item P? Second. Cast your vote. Passed unanimously. Item Q, understand we do need executive session on this item? Yes, sir. Second. All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item Q goes into executive session. Um, question R? R, I have some update information, but I think we ought to do the, the time of the day. We'll put that off for two weeks, so I'd recommend we do not go into executive session. Okay, so let's strike item R. Cast your votes. Item is struck. Item 8S, I understand we do need executive session. Uh, Mayor, I just got uh, an update from Dick Mahoney on that, and the plaintiffs have agreed to let us extend that for two weeks, so we, we can defer that for two weeks. All right, how about the motion then to defer item 8S for two weeks? Cash your votes. That item is deferred for two weeks. Item 8T is claims recommended for denial. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under any item listed under 8T? Okay, we have two people that have signed up to speak. Uh, Robert and Thigh Hart. Good morning. Good morning. We appreciate your patience with us this morning. I know you've been waiting a long time. Uh, your claim is item C, uh, $483. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. That is correct. Okay. What can you tell us about this? Well, um, it seems that uh, my wife, she goes to work by here every, pretty much every day. And uh, it's an issue that seems to be coming up quite often. And uh, here's some pictures from, what was it yesterday? Um, of that same manhole cover. Or it's, it's about a block away from the original one that she hit. Um, and there was no cones. It was a... Here's some pictures. And they did come out after being called. I mean, it was a huge block right there in the middle of the street where um, yeah, the ground had been uh, brought up, I guess, you know, pounded up, and uh, there was no um, cones. It was a hazard that was there. Okay. And uh, as of yesterday afternoon, after. <clears throat> Excuse me. Somebody was called. The so car was damaged. Yeah, her, and, her car. And there was, uh, you're saying there's no markings there or anything else. You had no way of knowing. No, there was All a right. manhole cover that had come up that she hit, and uh, they're saying that uh, the city's not liable for that uh, okay. because they weren't notified. And I just kind of. Well, let, let, let us get some advice from our staff here. I was wondering, is that the same manhole cover? Uh, oh, this, this one is a block away. Okay, this is a completely different one. Okay. They always seem to have problems yeah. in that area. Okay, I was unclear on that. Thank you. 
Yeah, Martin Luther King and, and Rhode Island. Okay. Sorry, I was making some notes to make sure that that was addressed. Um, Amy Harrison, Municipal Counselor's Office. Um, the claimant's um, incident occurred with no prior notice to the city that there was a manhole cover off and laying in the street. So without any prior notice, we didn't have an opportunity to send a crew out there to address the issue and claimant's witness statements support that as well. Yeah, I would only add that plaintiff, uh, the manhole cover was off and plaintiff struck it at approximately 7.50 a.m. And the city's first documented call that the, there was a problem with the manhole cover was uh, approximately five to 10 minutes later. And that was by one of the witnesses the uh, claimant re referred us to. So that was our first documented notice that the manhole cover had come off. And then I believe the city crew was out there in 20 minutes to fix it after that. But okay. plaintiff hit it first. Amy, is, is this a, a situation where you believe the council has the discretion to, to pay legally? No. There, there's no evidence of any negligence, no prior history of any problems with this manhole cover, no prior notice to the city and, or an opportunity to, to make repairs. I was afraid of that. So what you're telling us then, by, by state law in the state of Oklahoma, a municipality is not allowed to pay a claim unless we have been notified that there's an issue, so we have time to get out and fix it. That is correct. Right. And I'm afraid as, as sympathetic as we may be, we're not legally allowed to pay the claim as it's been described to us. Who would be legally responsible for that? I mean, it's a uh, manhole cover that is covered by uh, Oklahoma City and um, you know, if, if we were to do something to the city's property uh, because we had, you know, like uh, digging up the backyard or something and we had somebody come out there and mark all of them and they missed one and we dug it up, we would be liable. Yeah. If I were you, I'd feel the same way. I'm just telling you that legally, sure. to abide by state law, our legal advice is that we cannot pay the claim. Yeah. You would have opportunities to go across the street and file a suit um, at the county against right. the city. Okay. And I don't have I don't have any advice to give you on what your chances would sure. be there. Okay. All right. Thank you. We're Thank sorry. Thank you for your time. Uh -huh. um, Danielle Jackson. Hello, my good afternoon. Is, good afternoon. How are you? My car was hit by. Yeah, I'll, I'll need your name and address for the record. Danielle Jackson, P.O. Box 16456, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma 73113. Okay. My car was um, hit and damaged by a city traffic worker. He was text messaging, bagging up, and hit my car. My son was in the car. I did not file a suit for that. My son was not hurt. But my car, my son is asthmatic. My car, I'm just asking for you know, for my, my damages to be replaced. My air don't work due to the man bagging up into my, he was the one text messaging. So it was not my behalf. My car was parked in a parking spot. He's negligent, bagging up, text messaging on the phone, and then got the car in reverse. Okay. And I have um, statements with the, with the city courts or whoever that has my statement. But they said that they lost it, but I've been sending, kept getting it, giving them to them. Now I got a denial form. Okay, and the employee said that he or she was text he messaging? He was text messaging, yes. The um, person that was on the side of him, that was in a car with him, another employee, he re re told the police officer he was text messaging while he was backing into my car. Is there a police report that's, that we can see? Um, my police report, everything is filed um, on the second floor. Everything's what? Filed on the second floor. I got all my paperwork on the second floor. Okay, but you're did the I'm, I'm trying to, to to verify that our employee was at fault here. Yes. What what do you have to show me that that's the case? I thought everything was down here, but everything okay. is here. But so it's you're saying filed. it's on the police report. You just don't happen to have it. Let let, let yes. me get some legal advice here. Okay, Mayor, I can actually clarify that and and answer this real quickly. The 
we don't dispute what she says, and I believe there was a traffic collision report that found our employee at fault. That's Unfortunately, correct. the Tort Claims Act provides that the claim has to be filed with the city clerk within a year of the accident. The traffic collision report was dated March 23rd of 2012, and the claim actually wasn't received by the city clerk until June 6th of 2013, so it's barred by the statute of limitations. Did you wait a year I to file No, it? I submitted some, I submitted two of them last year, <coughs> and I submitted two of them this year, January and in um, February, I Okay, believe. do you have a copy of that? Everything is here, and well, okay, go ahead. The city clerk's office has no record of the claim being filed prior to June 6th of this year. Well, God knows the truth, and I'm not lying about that. I'm not suing on nothing. I just wanted my damages fixed on my car. As a single parent, it's not my fault that the city worker did that to my car. Yeah, do you have a he copy? Text do you have your copy or anything of when you filed it? Everything, I can go get it upstairs or wherever it's at here. I have all my paperwork here. You have a copy of your paperwork? They have everything. Well, I mean, they don't have if whatever not, you filed I can go last get it. year. Yes, I can go get it and submit it again and okay, put well, it in why somebody's Okay, well, why don't we pull this item and defer it? I, I, I even have pictures as well. What's that? I have pictures of my car and the city worker. It he, doesn't sound like uh, we're disputing the, the, the damage, oh, okay. but you know there are legal responsibilities okay. about the statute of limitations that we okay. can't violate. Okay. We're, I mean, we just we're not allowed to, whether we wanted to or not. Okay, so do I and need so to bring So what we the, need is is uh, just to, to verify that you filed that within those one year uh, statute of limitations, and I don't think there's going to be an issue here. But so far we haven't found it. So why don't why don't uh, why don't you talk with our staff about if you can? If They're you not compliant with it. me. They they ver verbally abusive towards me. They're they're very I don't know who. They're very unprofessional. Okay, so well. is there someone I can give it to, or Mayor, uh, as City Clerk, I will uh, do some research. Uh, okay. For the next two weeks, and I'll okay. be in touch with you. So do I need to bring you all the statements to you? Your name is Mrs. Francis. I have your phone number, and I'll call you. Okay. Uh, with the with the information. Okay, and I have a new number as well, so I can give it to that lady in there. Okay, all righty, thank right. you. Thanks, Danielle, and we're sorry this happened. Um, why don't we defer Danielle's issue for two weeks? Sound like it'd be all right? So how about a motion then to defer item T1E for two weeks? Second. All right, the, we're voting on to the deferral of her item, and that item is deferred two weeks. Is there anyone here else here wishing to speak on any item listed under claims recommended for denial? Okay, how about a motion then to, uh, for, the, for the rest of the claims? Cast your votes. And the rest of those claims are denied. We're on to item nine, it's claims recommended for approval. Is there anyone here wishing to speak or any item listed under item nine? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 10 is a resolution authorizing travel expenses for the mayor and city council members to attend the National League of Cities. Need a motion? Is it, is it possible to put an estimate of cost on these when we vote, when we bring these? I mean, we do that on everything else, it seems. Yeah, I don't know if we know how many are attending at this point, do we? So it's more of a blanket coverage for any council to attend. I don't know if we've got, if we know that. We could get what it's cost before, to you? I mean, but can you put that as part of the resolution? Yeah, but you know, there, it would it would depend on a lot of things. But certainly, you get an estimate. But it depends. You know, if, if a council member signs up for classes, continuing education classes, there's a cost to those. Right. If you stay one day, or if you stay three days, um, if you're doing committee work and you have to go earlier, and sometimes in the past we've had council members who served on committees. So, but uh, you know, there, there's certainly data from previous National League of Cities meetings that we could gather for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. A motion. Second. All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Items from council. James, you want to get us started? Yeah, I, I just want to thank uh, Officer Trey Rines for uh, driving me around. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I went on a police ride along and it was uh, very informative to me. And if anybody hasn't done that, I highly recommend it. It, it uh, helped me understand kind of what they do on a day to day basis. So it gave me a new appreciation for I police bet. officers. <laughs> All right, Ed. Larry. If you would, uh, Jim, pass along to the chief my thanks for 
having two of the officers from the uh, gang unit come out to the Windsor Forest Neighborhood Association. They did a good job explaining what go are going on in gangs and what the city's doing to uh, alleviate the problem. It was a great meeting. Thank you. All right. Pete? David? No, thank you. Meg? John? Pat? Sure. We've got all this extra time. I, um, <laughs> I received this report, I think several others have. It's, a, it's, a, it's published by the Oklahoma Municipal League about the legislation that's been passed this last session. And it's really a lot of them. And they indicate that several will have impacts on municipalities. I wonder if we could get a, a city version of this document that showed more specifically which of these items would have an adverse impact on the city's operations, or not necessarily adverse, what financial impact would be, might be worth it. I don't know. But I'd like to see that. We'd be happy to do that. And secondly, how much money do we have left in the 2000 bond issue we haven't spent yet? 2000? 2000, yes. We approved some projects today that went to the 2000 bond issue. I'll get, I'll get your report back on that. I'd like, because uh, it seems like it's an extraordinary long time. Uh, and I understand there's all sorts of obstacles for us to do that, but it seems like that we're doing a lot of 2007 projects before we ever finish 2000 projects. Yeah. There usually is a logical explanation, but it does seem weird. Yeah. I'm agree. sure there's a logical explanation. There always is, but. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed there. All right. City manager reports. Um, we have Chris uh, Tatham here uh, to come and, and uh, present to us our annual citizen survey. This is, gosh, I don't know how many years we've been doing this, Chris. A number oh, <laughs> of years. And it's really important because it allows us to benchmark Let both against it. other cities and to benchmark against ourselves on, on, on how the city's doing. And uh, with that, Chris. Great. It's a uh, mayor, members of the council. It's great to be back. I'm going to be sharing with you kind of the highlights of uh, this year's survey. I think most of you are familiar. The survey has been doing. Uh, the city's been doing this now for several years. I think the first survey was done in 2005 or 2006. And it really gives you a chance to hear what the typical resident thinks. Because what happens is most people are going through their busy lives and they just expect city services to be good. And so they don't come down here and tell you when they like what you're doing. You typically just hear from people who want to change the way things are done or when people don't like what you're doing. So as a result, this helps you balance the input you're getting from good special interest sources with the general public. So today what I'm going to be doing is walking through, let's see if, uh, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Doug over here. Actually, a little bit about our firm. If you haven't, you're not familiar with our firm, our firm is the nation's leader uh, in helping local governments gather input from uh, residents. Over the past uh, 10 years, we've surveyed nearly 2 million people uh, in more than 600 communities across the United States. 11 of the 20 largest cities and 10 of the 20 largest counties are our clients. So as we go through the report, I'm going to make comments about how the city of Oklahoma City stacks up against other large communities as part of this presentation. And this is just a brief listing of some of the communities that are our clients. Uh, there's a more complete list than the full part report, but I won't read that to you today. What I'm going to do today is briefly walk through the purpose and methodology of the survey. They basically stayed the same. I uh, give you our major findings up front in case it's getting late and uh, you're not able to focus. You'll at least know where I'm headed, tell you why I made those conclusions, and then recap and answer questions. As far as the purpose of the survey, it really allows you to objectively assess how well you're delivering major city services. It also gives you a sense for what residents think pr our priorities are in the community, community so you can address those concerns. Uh, and also it lets you see how things have changed over time. You know, this was a particularly important tool when the big economic recession hit, you know, in the late, just four or five years ago, to see how you all responded under those conditions. And what you see is you've done an extremely, extremely good job. As far as the methodology, each year uh, we select about 3,000 households at random from the entire city. Our goal is to get at least a third of them to participate in the survey. And it takes the average person about 15 to 20 minutes to complete the survey. So this is a very time-consuming effort, so you really are getting some quality input from your residents. Survey's done in English and Spanish, so we also include cell phones to make sure that all segments of the population are well represented. And if you look at the demographic composition of our sample, it pretty much mirrors the demographics of the city. It's not perfect, but it has an accuracy of about plus or minus 2.8% at the 95% level of confidence. And that essentially means if we did the survey the same way 100 times, 95 times out of 100, you get the same results within about 3%. So it's a very accurate tool for measuring things over time. In addition, we map uh, how people feel in different parts of the city. 
So we've included a number of maps. I just ask you to use some caution with those because each of the shaded areas isn't necessarily statistically valid. The goal for the maps is to help you use that information with other data sources to really help identify where you're doing well or where there might be opportunities for improvement. As far as this map, just basically shows you the location and you can see essentially the density of the respondents mirrors the density of the city's population. As far as the major findings this year, uh, clearly residents have a very positive perception of the city. Uh, overall satisfaction improved this year in 45 of the 65 areas that were rated compared to last year. Uh, there were only six significant decreases and of those six, two, you have the all time high. So you dropped a little bit, but you're still much better than other communities. Uh, the city's doing a fairly equitable job of providing services when you look at the distribution of the results across the city. And the issue related to streets continues to be the top priority, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail. As far as the perception that residents have of the city, this first slide shows you uh, the ratings from five to one. Uh, fours and fives are positive ratings, which are shaded in kind of blue or green. Negative ratings are people who are dissatisfied or in red. A neutral response isn't a don't know. Someone rates the, each of these items on a one to five, and they might say it's three and that typically means they're okay with the quality of the service. Uh, people who don't know how to rate the service or anything about that are excluded from these numbers. Uh, but you'll notice when it comes to the overall quality of city services, which is there in the middle, you've got 68% or over two out of three residents giving positive ratings, just 6% give negative ratings. So the ratio of people of positive to negative is over 11 to one. So every time somebody tells you the city's doing a terrible job, Remember, there's 11 people out there you're probably not hearing about from who think you're doing a, a very good job. And you'll see there's really no major areas of concern on any of these strategic issues that we assess. Uh, the next slide just is perceptions of neighborhoods. And you can see almost three out of four people think their neighborhood's not just a good place, but a great place to live. Uh, we just had one in 12 or tw one in eight people uh, disagree with that statement. And when it comes to perceptions of the quality of major categories of city services, you'll notice things like fire, ambulance, police, water services, all of those items at the top half of the list, generally you're doing very well. The areas where you have the biggest concern have to do with transportation. You'll see condition of streets, almost six in 10 residents give negative ratings. Public transit, more than one in three people are dissatisfied. In traffic flow, it's one in four. So there's clearly some opportunities to continue doing better, but what I'm gonna share with you in a little bit is that you're on the right path. As far as how you stack up to other communities, one of the things that you should be fe feeling very good about is you're setting the standard uh, in a number of the key areas we assess when we look at other communities with more than 250,000 residents. On this chart, Oklahoma City's in blue, the national average for large cities is in yellow. Everywhere you see a setting the standard means you have the highest current rating in our database of large cities. And that database actually has about 40 some different cities with more than 250,000 residents. You'll see you're setting the standard as a place to live, as a place to raise children, as a place to retire. The overall quality of city services set a new high at 68% and how well you're planning growth is at 67%. So you're definitely doing a lot of things right. In fact, when you look at all the strategic indicators which are shown in this chart, you don't trail the national average in any area. In fact, you're above average and significantly above average in most of them showed by the blue arrows on the left. The next chart shows how you stack up on the quality of major city services. And when it comes to customer service and your efforts to communicate with the public, again, you're setting the standard compared to other large communities. You're trailing a little bit in parks and recreation, but when it comes to condition of city streets, you can see that's really the one area uh, that you trail rather significantly. You're 18 points about below the national average for other large communities, and the large average tends to be lower than the national average for all cities, because smaller and medium-sized cities tend to do better in that area. But all in all, be very pleased that the culture of service that you have with your employees is setting the standard. It's very rare to see a rating. In fact, you just set the new high on customer service at 64% for a large city. So you definitely must have systems in place and a culture that's really responsive to residents and you're doing a great job of keeping residents informed about those issues. As far as your utility services, your bulky item pickup and your water service are setting the standard. So even as I show you a little bit of the trends, bulky item has dropped a little bit. Uh, you're still setting the standard because that's one of the best, uh, that is the current best rating in our database. Uh, residential trash collection is also significantly above average and you can see you're pretty much on par when it comes to recycling services. 
As far as how you are providing services citywide, one of the things you'll see in the full report are a series of about 50 maps. For today's presentation, I'm just going to share with you two. This first one is just the overall rating that residents give based on where they live. It's shaded by zip code uh, that shows uh, the average rating for all the residents who lived in that area. And you'll see the legend to the right uh, that the satisfied area is shown in blue or dark blue in pretty much the entire city, minus a couple of your lesser populated areas uh, to the west, uh, give the city very good ratings. So for the most part, you're doing a very good job of equitably meeting the overall expectations citywide. But you will see some differences. Uh, for example, I pulled up the condition of neighborhood streets, and you can see it's more an issue when you're developing in lesser populated areas away from the center of the core of the city. You can see that's where you actually have greater concerns about street maintenance than others. And you can see some of these differences in the maps. Just remember that the number of respondents per area that's shaded tends to be low in some cases, so it may not be a, a, a true test of what things are. I'd compare this data with other condition information that you might have access to. As far as how you, things have changed, you'll see on the next chart that of the 65 areas that were rated both last year and this year, uh, the city improved in 45 of them. Uh, there were only six significant decreases, but the thing I want to point out to you is that your overall rating keeps stair-stepping up each and every year. In 2011, you were at 64% for your overall rating. It went up two points in 2012. It went up again this year. So even though the short-term change of 2% isn't statistically significant, the long-term trend for the city seems to be very, very positive. Uh, when we look at some of the specific services, you'll think things like fire, ambulance, parks and recreation, water services, and customer service all saw significant improvements compared to a year ago. However, condition of streets has decreased, and that's your number one priority. And I know the city's been doing a lot more in that area. Uh, what I've seen in other cities is when you start investing and you start tearing up roads and you start having construction, it's not unusual to see the short-term ratings go down because, frankly, when things are being built and under construction, it tends to cause people to feel more negative than they were to begin with. So I would suspect as you start to finish most of your projects or many of your projects, you should see that increase. You may also want to take a look at just the overall process for managing that. Are people getting adequate notice? What do they think about the condition and the safety of sites? But all in all, the fact that everything else in the survey seems to be going up when streets are the top priority suggests to me that you have your priorities aligned correctly. It's just that people are suffering the short-term pain of the construction that you're doing. As far as when you look at the code enforcement issues, this was one of the areas we identified in previous surveys as an opportunity for improvement. And you can see uh, sign regulations, animal control, neighborhood yard parking regulations, and your efforts to remove inoperable vehicles all saw significant improvement uh, from a year ago. Uh, when it comes to city maintenance, you can see snow removal, uh, adequacy of street lighting, the condition or cleanliness of streets and the overall cleanliness of stormwater drains all went up significantly, but you'll see neighborhood streets has now stared stepped down a little bit, and it could be some expectations rising. As you talk about streets, as you start investing in streets, I think people have voted for street packages. What happens is that starts to raise expectations, and when we look at the neighborhood street map, you can see some of the folks in the areas further away from the core of the city are the least satisfied, and that's probably contributing to that as a rising expectations and just the need to manage that. When it comes to parks and recreation, you can see several areas have improved, the golf course, athletic programs, your recreation centers, location of parks, your pools, and even your recreation opp opportunities along the Oklahoma River all saw significant increases from a year ago. Uh, as far as communication, uh, you can see the overall rating for availability of information for of city services is down a little bit, but your website, use of social media, and your website as a way to transact, transact business with the city all went up significantly. What impresses me here is that your sustained increases on your website. A lot of cities are having a harder and harder time keeping up with expectations for residents because the web's always changing, technology is always improving. So the fact that you've seen your re results go up 4% from two years ago, up again 3% this year, really shows you have a good process in place for keeping that up to date. This summary, all those little blue arrows that I showed you are all listed here. There were a lot of significant increases, which I think you can be very proud of. Uh, the next chart is just the decreases, and you can see of the six, 
Two of them, the planning for growth and your bulky item pickup were areas that I showed you were setting the standard in your overall performance. So you're way above most other communities. You had a slight decrease, which I don't think you need to worry about given your position compared to other communities. You can see the other items though, the street issue uh, is an area that I know is a high priority. So that's something you wanna continue monitoring. But I sense that the short term decreases are probably the result of the construction and other things that you're doing. As far as your top priorities as you move forward, uh, you can see we ask people to rank of all the major services you provide. We ask them to pick the three they think are the most important. More people pick streets uh, than any of the other issues combined top three. And almost three out of four people picked it as one of their top three choices. So it clearly stands hand, head and shoulders above the other issues as a priority. But we don't just look at the importance. We also take a look at the relative levels of satisfaction I showed you before. And we have a tool that helps you set priorities based on not just how well you're doing or how important things are, but by bringing both of those two items together. And you can see based on this analysis, the important satisfaction rating, which is really your priority rating, is highest for condition of city streets. And then you'll see closely tied for second are traffic flow and public transit issues. Most of the other items are medium priorities, which really suggests the way you're allocating your resources now is in line with residents' expectations, and there's no real gaps there. If you're a visual person, this shows you the same information on a chart. As you go from left to right, that's the importance. Bottom to top is the satisfaction. The items in the bottom right are those that are more important than average where your performance is not as high. And the further you get to the bottom right, the higher priority uh, that is generally for residents. And you can see streets is over there, traffic flow and city transit are kind of a tied uh, second and third. So with all that information, just to kind of recap what I shared today uh, as we went through the results, uh, code enforcement, continuing to emphasize the mowing and trimming of grass and the cleanup of debris on pro uh, private property is really the key thing to do there. Maintenance, it's just street issues are really the top, both on the major streets and neighborhoods. And then parks and recreation, getting information out to folks and walking on biking trails. These are the areas within your major categories of city services that you can enhance each of these departmental performances. Finally, as I said up front, uh, I think you've got a great community. Your residents clearly feel that way by the high ratings they give for the city's overall in many of the areas that were assessed. You're clearly moving in the right direction and you're doing that at a time when most other communities are struggling to stay where they're at. Most high performing communities like Oklahoma City are seeing themselves go backwards. In other words, it's easier to move from the bottom up in difficult times. It's hard to stay at the top. But the fact that your overall rating has gone up now for two consecutive years and you've set a new standard, I think is something to be really proud of. Streets is gonna to continue to be an issue for you, but I think as you complete many of the projects you've started, you'll ultimately see that rating uh, turn around. That's typically what happens in other communities that have been in similar situations. So with that, I don't know if there's any questions, Mayor, but I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, questions? Yeah, I, so I'm looking in like in the page 60s and 70s where you've got it mapped out by the city, by area. And so when you say city streets, you're asking them, you're asking them one, four, you're asking them about major city streets, condition of streets in their neighborhoods, street signs, condition of pavement markings, and then you go into snow removal. And so, so when you say condition of city streets, that's including things like street signs and condition of pavement markings. Yeah, typically the, the overall rating up front kind of encompasses everything. We then have a series of questions about streets later on. If you actually turn to page 73, I believe that's where the street question maps begin. And you can see several. And you'll notice that uh, what we found in the data is the overall rating is most strongly correlated with the answers to condition of major streets and neighborhood streets. There's other aspects of street maintenance. You can see the signs and so forth on the next couple pages, but those ratings tend to be better. The bulk of the dissatisfaction tends to be related to the condition of the streets themselves, which through our research typically indicates the quality of the pavement and the infrastructure. And so what, what question specifically did you ask about public transit? Just this Public point? transit, if you turn a couple, actually I think it might have been the previous uh, couple pages, you can see on the public transit side, uh, the map for that is on page 60. So if you okay. look at the bottom of page 60, you can actually see perceptions. And you can see they're fairly uniform. 
uh, throughout the city. There's a couple pockets of negativity, uh, but for the most part, the city is in about the same shape. Okay, thanks. Okay, Thank any you. other questions? We appreciate all your work, and uh, we take these things very seriously. So thanks for your due diligence of your entire team. No, thanks for having us. All right. Just a couple quick things. There's a city manager report about the uh, jail safe cost recovery program that's in, in your packet. One of the council asked about that a couple of weeks ago. And then we have the July sales and use tax collections. It's about $1.2 million was the sales tax check in July under target. Um, one of the reasons for that is that last July was a really good year. But I don't want to sugarcoat this. Uh, sequestration is beginning to take place. I think there's some, there's some, uh, there's some reserve spending in anticipation of, of that going on. But on the other hand, is not to capitalize on an unfortunate situation, but generally we see increased spending on the recovery after major weather events. And so we anticipate if that's the case, that'll probably come in in August and September because it typically has in the past. And so that's what's out there. We're, you know, we'll see the, the August check in the next couple of weeks and we'll, we'll keep you apprised. This is not a positive trend, but I'm not sure how deep a trend it is at this point. All right, any other questions for the city manager? I just want to congratulate him on this report. It's the result of his efforts primarily that we've been able to achieve these outstanding results. I think it's a, It's not my efforts. It's a great team that works, you know, but, every day cranking out. But every team has a leader, and you've done a great job on it. Agreed. No, I would agree with Pat. That's, it, that's really a reflection of the leadership of the city. I'm very proud of it. Right, and also the employees. I mean, don't we do we accomplish this with less employees per, per capita, capita than, than any other major city? Right. Absolutely. Right. We have two citizens that have signed up to be heard. Uh, David Brook. More people got up and left when I called David Brook's name. <laughs> well, the real David Brook. Please stand up. All right, Joe Sarge Nelson. I know Joe's here. Thanks, Joe, and you'll have three minutes to, to talk. Joe Sarge Nelson, <clears throat> pardon me. Joe Sarge Nelson, Oklahoma City. I was real proud of today. This has been the most exciting time I've been. I've been coming here a long time. I got to see democracy in action. Everybody got to speak, including Mrs. Kersey. Anyway, the real reason I'm here a couple of weeks ago, I, I appeared before this very council to implore, uh, implore each one of you to spend the funding on the current streetcar system. Uh, the project pending a better understanding by the uh, taxpayers of Oklahoma City. In other words, proposal on both the cost of dollars as well as the MAPS policy purposes of these exact routes. I think in light of the number of voices in this community stepping up to oppose this plan, including Devon Energy's CEO, Larry Nichols, as well as many others, it has made it abundantly clear that the streetcar plan has serious flaws. From design with the electrical wires, to senseless routes, to runaway costs that could eventually destroy the future of any of the MAPS programs. Suspending further funding, uh, funding of this streetcar plan is more than common sense. Everyone knows what a boondoggle is. The taxpayers know about the boondoggle and the bridge to nowhere in Alaska. Now Oklahoma City is about to get our own boondoggle. It's about to get uh, 4.2 miles of track to nowhere and $120 million to take us from downtown to midtown. The three must, most traveled to destinations in Midtown are a bakery, a bar, and a hospital. And the cost for fixed rails to these locations cannot be even justified. After attending the public meeting on the streetcars twice, the worst public meeting I've ever attended, by the way, the purpose of the streetcar routes became clear. Economic development along the routes this treats the tracks like our canal. The streetcar is a public transportation. The canal is entertainment. 
The public transportation needs to start where people live and take them where a destination they need to go. We don't need a fun train to go to lunch. Public transportation is to benefit those who really need it, not those who simply profit from it. Profiteers would have their businesses trail the rails. A handful of developers would clean up and make a lot of money. We need to keep our purposes straight. Public transportation services for those who need it. You don't need a $100 million streetcar to buy a donut or go to a beer joint or get an MRI. We need to slow down the runaway streetcar before this gets too far down the road and becomes too late. Now's the right time to take a breath and reconsider this project. And as you as council have the time to exercise good judgment and take a pause to allow more information and input from the citizens of Oklahoma City before going on any further. That last MAPS meeting raised more questions than we got answers. My grandmother used to say, measure twice, cut once. And that advice is solid to this very day. But this is now your all's time. What you do with the streetcar proposal is what the citizens of Oklahoma City will measure you by. Measure carefully. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. We're adjourned. Uh, we recess. Oh. I mean, we're. That's right. Uh, we're not done, <laughs> Mayor. We're recess. <laughs>